Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Nightmare Hunter in America. Oh, I'm sorry, the Nightmare Hunter with Roger Noriega. DA, you got me going on that one. But, ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful, wonderful day, and I've got to change my name. I'm under another persona right now. I do apologize. I'm going to have to fix that right now. But joining me on this wonderful, glorious evening are two of the men in the genre and not only in the genre on the front line and sure enough there it is da thank you thank you for getting it right i am the nightmare hunter ladies and gentlemen i am that person but joining me on this wonderful evening uh we're expecting our guest to join us shortly but we'll get to it today is may 10th 2021 yesterday was mama's day in the united states and today in the latin world is mama's day <laughs> so to everyone Back to back, we hope you've enjoyed the last two days. And now, who knows? We might get scared out of our mamas. Who knows? We'll see right now. But that's the man right there. He is the co-host of this program, D.A. Roberts, and our special yeah. co-host tonight, and who is becoming one of our regulars, if not. Uh, he's not a guest. He is no longer a guest, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, he's a part of the family. He is a host, if not a co-host. And it is the man who is on the front line protecting all of us from that which goes bump in the night. And I do not make a joke of it because that's a slogan. But ladies and gentlemen, our hero, the man that goes where angels fear to tread. And he is right there, Nick Valente. Good evening, Nick. How are you? Good evening, Roger. Hey, DA. Hey, Nick. How you doing, buddy? Real good. How are you doing, DA? I'm doing well. I'm out here protecting everybody with hammer there you go and so it begins and ladies and gentlemen we've already got some likes we're gonna get to them right now forgive me uh, uh -oh. in the chat room uh all tower media has a comment you can support my page by sending stars a digital gift that helps me earn money excellent we have thomas whitney in the chat room and as a matter of fact we have several likes as i mentioned thomas whitney joshua dalton general and uh, we have Roger Peacock, Adam Shepard, and lo and behold, D. Hay, would you bring aboard the man of the hour? Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to announce M.K. Davis. I am a huge fan of yours, sir. Uh, I, I've been following, following your Facebook page. The work you've done with the Patterson-Gimlin film is amazing. Uh, I watched the video that you, uh, you did on the Honey, Honey Island swamp, swamp Monster when you found that shoe. That video, that also, that, that was so awesome. I love that. That's, I think that's my favorite uh, documentary you've done. Well, I thank you. Uh, I've had some revisions on that. Uh, up until that time, I had not found anything on my own that would indicate that there was a monster in the swamp. But mm -hmm. since since then, I have. Really? Uh, yeah. So the but the the last four or five years. I have found tracks. And I have found numerous other things that that indicate that uh, that there is. And then, and then Dana Holyfield found the film uh, that her dad, that her grandfather took, uh, mm -hmm. and and I, I did a pretty good examination of it. And and it seems to pass muster. So I'm having to rethink some of the things there on Honey Island. You know, since I made that documentary. Yeah, the one the one you made where you guys found the shoe, I to me to me I thought, well, that just puts that to bed. That's that's all a hoax. But if you found new information, are you going to be doing a new documentary? Well, I probably should. Uh, well, I know uh, I'll definitely watch it. Uh, I found uh, a big three toed print just like that. I took my wife to visit a friend at Oshner's in in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and I dropped in on Honey Island unannounced. And I went off trail along a slough. So I know no one set this up. And, and, and in that swamp, they have clay underneath in pockets uh, that absorbs a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And then when you get a dry crust on top, it sometimes will swell up and erupt through. And you'll have a, what I call a spit of clay, mm -hmm. a wet clay on otherwise dry ground and that track was dead center of one of those spits and it it had three toes and you know i i, I looked at it and and i kind of thought to myself i said well 
you know, this can't be true. <laughs> but it was true. And, and so I, I had to, and, 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 and as we all do in life, I had to walk some things back. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I know that no one else did that. They didn't know I was coming or anything. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I began to drop in on Honey Island more often. Mm-hmm. And and so uh, and, in doing so, uh, uh, in the certain areas around there, uh, at certain times of the year, you begin to find uh, things that are kind of textbook Bigfoot. Um, I found a, 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 a fresh, I came in one one time on the heels of some storms, and it had uh, just stopped raining about ten minutes prior to me arriving. So when I got on the trail, uh, I found a freshly broken tree, were snapped off, and then the piece made into an X across that trail, and. When I looked down in the broken part, there was no water. So I know that it had to have just been done right out ahead of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that you find like at Bluff Creek. Yeah. You know, uh, textbook uh, Bigfoot stuff. So when I saw her film, well, what I what I was able to do a frame by frame of that film it, it too looked textbook Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, monster, Bigfoot, or, or whatever, you know. Some type of Bigfoot I, derivative? Yeah, there's something in the swamp. Um, I feel pretty sure. So, yeah. I don't mind walking something back. You know, uh, it's, it, it's a, uh, you're, we're in a business where there's, it's just, you know, evidence is scanned anyway. Mm hmm. And I don't want to fail to give someone their due exactly. or, or fail, fail to be right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where a lot of people do. Uh, it's, it's, people are so afraid of being wrong that they fail to be right. Uh, they, they, something comes in front of them and, and they, they, it's, it's not exactly what they think it should be. So they just dismiss it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so three toe track, you know, you know, you have to just, whatever's there on the earth, the print that you see, something made it. Yeah. And if it only has three toes, something must only have three toes, you know, but yeah, it, you're after crypto, crypto subjects. So, you know, no one knows for sure what they are anyway. Exactly. So, yeah, if I may. To- if I may interrupt, mm-hmm. ladies and gentlemen, we're off to a wonderful start already. We have MK Davis with us. We've done intros for everyone else, but Mr. Davis. <laughs> Mr. Davis, why don't you go ahead and let our, if you would share with our audience uh, who you are, where you're at, and kind of what it is that you do, sir, <laughs> and what you've done. <laughs> well, um, I, I kind of backed into this, uh, the crypto, uh, crypto zoological pursuit. Uh, um, actually I was uh, into astrophotography, which is, uh, taking space photographs, uh, through a telescope. And it, you know, it required at the time it was done with film Mm -hmm. and and it required, uh, you know, some techniques there for rescuing very faint objects, you know, that are, they're on timed exposures and things like that. And, uh, when I first saw some really good prints from the Patterson film, it, it was so much better than anything I'd ever seen on television. And, and, and when I saw them, I, I said, well, somebody has filtered these images much the same as you would a, a filter, uh, an astro photograph, uh, trying to get boost the contrast and, and see more on it. And so I, I said, well, there must be a better version of this film somewhere. Because all I've ever seen is is fuzzy, grainy, dark um, versions of it that were shaky, and so I began an inquiry. I don't know what that was. It's in my phone. Uh, I began an inquiry 
uh, into that uh, as to where I could get frames that I could process in a way similar to the astrophotography I was doing. And uh, I began to uh, make contacts. I went to Oregon and I spoke in Oregon and I contacted some Canadians there who came across with a lot of really good frames. Uh, and, and, and my, my inquiry continues until today. I've worked with several different copies of the Patterson film. I've got copies. I've got the frames from Miss Patterson directly from her. Uh, I've got frames from uh, John Green. Uh, I've got frames uh, from other copies, you know, that are out there, and yeah. uh, and so uh, I've not only been able to to process them and and reconstruct them in a stabilized form, you know, where they you take the hand motion out, uh, but when whenever you whenever you get rid of some of the lensing defects, it boosts the sharpness considerably. And if you do that just 1%, you'll see on average about 10 new things. Mm -hmm. So imagine over the years I've reprocessed the film as I, as new uh, methods become available. Uh, it's probably been six or 7% boosted and, and 60 or 70 new things. You see, uh, when you have a threshold film like that, it's al it's almost on the verge of being a good film, and then you're able to process it. Then it crosses that threshold, and it becomes a great film. And 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 what you begin to see is what you see in everyday life. When you go out into the, across the street and you see people, you see biomechanics, you see muscles moving and scapulas you know, moving, uh, and, and so those kinds of things are very, very difficult to duplicate in a suit. Uh, and, and I would venture to say in 1967, especially by these two people, impossible. Mm. Uh, so uh, I, it, it, it has to be accepted as it is, uh, you know, and, and I think that, that there, there's been a cottage industry kind of come up around the Patterson film, uh -huh. both neg negative and positive. Uh, a lot of skeptics have cut their teeth on that film as well. Yeah. And, and, and there's been a lot of false claims. And so I, I found out over the years as I've improved the film that, that I, I've, I, I've been, even though I didn't set out to, be this way I've, I've become sort of an advocate for it um it it needs an advocate because uh, it really got off on the wrong foot way back when in 1967 and mm. and so uh make making those uh making those turnarounds for the film uh has been very important you know uh the the, the old arguments no longer apply and and people need to understand that yeah Mr. Davis, um, what are your thoughts on the fellow that came forward years ago and said that he was paid $5,000 to wear a, a suit that was created for that film? Any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. You're talking about probably Bob Hieronymus. Is, yeah. Am, is that, yeah. Right. Uh, Bob, Bob Hieronymus is a, uh, is a neighbor of Bob Gimlin. Right. And they were, they were childhood friends. And uh, they were even in a in a movie together that that was uh, going to be produced by Roger Patterson before he took the film of the Bigfoot, the actual real Bigfoot. Uh, he was going to make a feature film, and he had written a script, and they were all going to be in it. Um, I, I don't want to say for positive that this is it, but my guess is that if they wore a suit, it was for that feature film and not what you see in the Patterson film. That makes, that makes more sense now. And it does clear a lot up because he, uh, his, his friend and next door neighbor claimed that uh, he went over to the house and he opened his trunk and he showed uh, Mr. Gimlin's mother. And uh, I believe one of his kids, the, the, the suit 
And uh, I mean, that created a big hubbub at the time. But you're correct in the fact that when you look at the film, and I mean, I've looked at the film myself and I've magnified it on a 65 inch screen. And I have some applications where I can really zoom in and clear it up. I've saw muscle movement and I, I don't think at the time that they had anything near that type of technology to show muscle movement. Uh, I don't even know if they have it now to tell you the truth. Not, not, not well, no. uh, you know, it's, uh, what you see there is, is like I said, just what you see in, in life everywhere. Right. Uh, it's recognizable. And, and so it, it, that being the case, uh, then that is ground zero for a pursuit to discover the, the species or, mm -hmm. or, or the tribe, whatever, whatever it is, if it's a primitive human or if it's a, a you know, a gigantopithecus, that needs to be sorted out. But you have to have a beginning point. And the beginning point is, is getting past, do, do they exist? And, I, and, I firmly believe they do. Yeah. Well, that film seems to indicate that, that they do, uh, for sure. Well, even so, the FBI, uh, when they released their files on it, they said that, the, that there was enough evidence to conclude that at the time there was a creature. Uh, I, th to me, that's just tantamount to saying, yes, it exists, because if there's one, there's got to be others. That, that It wasn't just one creature down through the centuries. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and if there's one, there's got to be others. There's got to be a mom and a pop and a, probably brothers and sisters and... You know, I, I, I uh, like I said, there, there, there's been kind of two sides of the cottage industries that came up mm -hmm. along with that film, and the other side is the skeptical side. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, skeptics, uh, they make the argument, you know, that that cryptozoology, there's no real uh, degree that you can get in cryptozoology. And I, and I have to remind them that there's no real degree that you can get in skepticism. <laughs> uh, skepticism is learned on the on the fly, just like just like anything else is. You know, uh, uh, if you want to be critical uh, and have a skeptical eye, you can find something wrong with almost everything. Mm -hmm. Even even our Zoom meeting, somebody could find something wrong with it. You know. Yeah. Um, Mr. Davis, I have found, though, in, in Europe, uh, Austria being one country and uh, Hungary was another where they have a college in each one where I was able to take a course in cryptozoology and actually got a diploma course in, uh, from each one. Because I feel, like, <laughs> I, mean, I feel like, I mean, you couldn't get it in the United States, so I had to go outside, you know, over the border. But I mean, they they did bring a lot of good stuff to the table, you know, for the for the money. I have to admit that. I just I just wish we would catch up over here. Um, I was speaking with another cryptozoologist uh, yesterday during the morning for a good three hours in the early morning, and um, we were talking about why. And I mean, I've always been asked this question: why, you know, people don't see Sasquatch and Dogman a lot. You know, and uh, why they can't get great pictures. Well, for one, I would think they would sleep during the daytime and hunt during the nighttime. And if they're hunting during the nighttime or if they're around eating things at nighttime, you're a lot less apt to be able to see them. And uh, forest areas that they hang out in and everything, you know, unless you're out there specifically hunting them with night vision and you know they're there, you're not going to find them. I mean, that's, that's one of my theories anyway. Well, that sounds reasonable. It's uh, you're you're looking for, you're looking for uh, essentially legends. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, people have only only the best encounters have been very brief. Mm -hmm. and, and so and so, if if you're wanting to put it in the books, uh, you know, the requirements are pretty high for actually putting something in a textbook and and. Uh, so a, a dog man would be something that pro the bar would probably be even higher. <laughs> um, I have you know, to tell you, uh, it's it's very high because I had an encounter with a dog man. I was 30 feet away and I did not think to grab a camera. 
I had pepper spray in one hand and a 10 millimeter Glock in the other. And I'm going to tell you, no way in hell was I going to reach for my, my cell phone and put it in cat. Excuse me, Mr. Dog, man. I got to put this in camera mode. Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> they don't pose for you. And I, I came across a bear. It's been a few years ago at Bluff Creek. And, and I was hiking and I had a hiking stick in my hand and I was curiously enough, I was just looking down at the ground and, you know, at my feet Yeah. and, and I heard the bear breathing and <laughs> I looked, I looked up and the bear was coming straight at me and he was looking down at his feet. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? We were, we were about, we were about to run into each other. <laughs> Like that old Bugs Bunny cartoon, bread and butter, bread and wow. butter, bread and butter. What kind, what kind of bear was it? Brown, black? It, it, well, it was one of those peculiar Bluff Creek black bears that seemed to have a little uh, brown in them. Uh -huh. um, they, uh, it, the sun was behind it, and I could see the sun through the fur, and it was, it was, uh, it reminded me of a grizzly in a way. It kind of had a, oh. a hump hump on the shoulder but it wasn't big it wasn't big enough to be a grizzly had chocolate colored eyes and i looked him dead in the eye which you're never supposed to do they tell me <laughs> and and for a split second him and i kind of communicated and I, I don't know if you've ever gotten a bad dog in front of you and you could kind of read that dog a little bit uh -huh. and what his intentions were well it was kind of like that and I could tell that the bear was not going to do anything. Uh, and and he just kind of uh, glared at me for a second and then bounced off and jumped down an almost vertical embankment. Wow. Uh, I guess I only can guess that he must have just hit and rolled, you know. Yeah. Takes a lot to hurt those things, I'll tell you that. Well, I was grateful that he didn't want to hurt me. and But you know what? I had a camera around my neck. <laughs> and I, I, I never touched it. it. Nope. How close did you were? How close? I was at 20 feet, maybe. <laughs> That's good. That's pretty close. That is. I uh, could have got, got me a, a really good wall hanging picture if I uh, wanted to just pick it up in my hands and do it. But, you know, the, the heat of the moment. Or the two of uh, you, you could have been like this and did a selfie, you know. Excuse me. <laughs> Well, you know that's the that's the extraordinary thing about the Patterson film is that he did get his camera and get that, yeah. um, which is uh, uh, I'm sure there's been plenty of opportunities, but people just can't seem to be become you know they're transfixed by what's going on there. What's well, a paradigm and, shift? You know, yeah. two seconds ago you didn't believe it existed, and there yeah. it is. It's hard. It's hard to. To, to have camera on your mind when that's going on, you're looking at something that that you're not supposed to even be seeing. Oh, and uh, so so I can understand that. But Patterson was camera ready in his case, mm -hmm. that was which is really fortunate for us that he captured that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It uh, it's it's it turned uh, the the whole world of anthropology on its ear. You know, well, I, forgot his, I forgot his name, but there was a Russian zoologist that studied that film for over two and a half years and came to the conclusion that it was real. It was authentic, that what he captured there was uh, was the was the real deal. Yeah, the Russians studied it extensively. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know Igor Bortsev did uh, and Dmitry Bayanov. That's the and, one. That's the fellow. Yeah. Uh, and, and let me tell you what, those guys are, are astute observers. Uh, and some of the things that I discovered on the film through technology, they had discovered it already through calculations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they carefully calculated Roger Patterson's up and down motions as, as he was. And then they figured film speed based on that and mm -hmm. distance to the subject, you know, taking what the film would give them. Uh, and, you know, I, and some of the things 
I discovered that she wasn't using her left arm very much in a natural way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the arms are used to counterbalance as we step and the left one, she wasn't, they, they had already determined that there was something amiss with her left arm, you know? Uh, so the Russians were kind of, uh, uh, ahead in a lot of ways in the sense that, that they weren't constrained by rampant skepticism. Yeah. Uh, they, they just, they just looked at it and said, what does the film tell us and what is it going to give us? And, and then they made their decision based on that. And that, that's science. It didn't happen over here in the States like that though. Uh, based on your observation and, and other observations, what would you say would have been roughly the height and weight of Patty? The the height is going to be about six five there and about, so maybe a little more, maybe a little lower, because um, she's bent over and she's on a broken ground. Okay, the weight from what I've been able to determine is about double what you think it should be. Really? Yeah. Uh, in other words, if if a cubic inch of Sasquatch flesh would weigh about double what a cubic inch of modern man's flesh. Right. Much, much denser muscle. bone and flesh. It's much denser. Way denser. If it looks like it weighs 500, you can you can uh, uh, count on a thousand. That could explain some of the accounts from hunters that claims they've shot one with no effect. Yeah, it's so dense it's hard to penetrate. Um, it's got, it's got. I, I found a set of tracks in 2015 uh, on the sandbar there at Bluff Creek, and I could not put a dent in the ground, and they went four inches. Wow, four inches, four inches deep. We're talking what? Then 1,800 pounds. I, that thing, that thing weighed. It, it was scary. Um, um, I photographed them and, and videotaped them. I didn't have plaster with me. I kind of wish I had. Uh, it was about 12 to 15 tracks. Um, and I had some Japanese gentlemen with me, and uh, they they weren't serious until they saw those. <laughs> and then then they, they wouldn't let me out of their sight. <laughs> Suddenly it got a little real. Yeah, well, they they didn't want anything that because they didn't think they could get out of there. You know, how big were the tracks, roughly heel to toe? Uh, they were about uh, almost about fourteen inches. It's a big track. Well, it's it's not. There's bigger tracks, oh, but yeah. I don't think I've ever seen anything that that deep, that so they're, highly. They're highly very compressed. very dense. So Supposedly, one one at six foot, say six. Set, we'll say seven feet tall. Like right. uh, one that would probably weigh in the ballpark of a thousand pounds. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's a big animal. The if it stepped, of, if it stepped on your foot, it would crush all the bones in your oh, foot. Man. Guys, you, supposedly, if you got a quarter of an inch, uh, a human male, it would be about two hundred pounds. So you're talking about two inches there. I mean, we're you're probably talking the upwards of sixteen hundred pounds or more. That's that's. Yeah. That's There's, amazing. And you said the, dry? The, there was a man, uh, a, a science institute called NASI, North American Science Institute. And back in the 70s, they were commissioned to uh, study the Patterson film. And, and the, uh, met a fellow by the name of Jeff Glickman determined that Patty weighed 1,400 pounds. Yeah. And the, the, the whole world of Bigfoot were just up uproar over mm -hmm. that but as as more information comes in it appears that he was probably correct yes sir. Well, i've said for a long time they, they they've got to be very very dense um you've got a question mr davis from one of our guests greg price asks uh what does your guest think of bill munn's peer-reviewed debunking of the man in the suit theory published in meldrum's journal well, I, I don't know about debunk. If I, I I haven't read all of that, so I hate to comment too much on it. I know Bill; uh, he does pretty good work. Uh, he done some work on the film as well. 
And uh, I agree with him that it's real. You know, uh, we may not agree on everything, but I agree with him on that. That's fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, and I admire, I admire anybody that would take this up, you know. Uh, yeah. Usually it's to their own detriment. And, and they, you know, that the fact that they'll do it, uh, in spite of the fact that they, it's not good for a career or not good for uh, uh, relationships and things like that, uh, I admire that, and uh, and I thank him for his efforts. I sure do. Uh, Sean Bussard wants to know: Did it walk heel to toe? Heel to toe, yes. The rock rocked over. Uh, I'm gonna tell you something about the awkward gate has as much to do with mass as anything. Um, you, when you see P the Patterson subject, and it's got, it's got the the leg sticking straight back. Uh, you know, behind it, that is not a walking gait. You see it right there. That's a running gait. But you say, well, she's not running. You know why has she got a running gait? It's because of mass. Mass and forward motion, forward mo uh, momentum, carries it over the fulcrum into it, it, like it was jogging, it, but much, much slower. You, we could not maintain a a run like that very long, you know, that, that slow. Mm -hmm. uh, but but because of their mass, uh, and the, it also uh, also the 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 line of prints that are in a line with each other is a result of a running gait we all leave footprints in a line if we run it's only it's we only get side by side when we walk mm -hmm. uh so you're looking at a running gait but at, at a, it's normal for the sasquatch uh, it's uh, it's very very slow for a run, but he she's got the mass to keep her going, you know at that with that gait. Uh, so that that's an odd and unusual thing. And when people see it, they say uh, it looks like a glide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's essentially is a a running gait, but very slow, a very slow run. Well, if it's got that much mass, it would take a tremendous amount of force to get it up to any kind of speed. You're right. And if it got up to a speed, it would be hard to stop. Mm -hmm. You know, That's, so it, it, I've heard it people, operates uh, differently. I've heard um, reports of ones crashing off through the woods, and they've described it as sounding like a, tr like a, like a truck crashing through the woods. It, well, if, if you've ever seen the, uh, the picture that people have hanging on their walls, is it footprints in the sand. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a little prayer usually with it, you know. Uh, you, they're all in a row, in a line, and it's a person who jogged down the beach, you know. Uh, so people say, well, the uh, inline footprints are a sign that it's a Sasquatch. Well, yeah, it could be, uh, or a person who's running, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't you know, think you'd it, find too many people out in the deep woods running barefoot. No, and, and especially if you can kind of tell – if it's four inches deep, that is not your average person. Uh, no, no, it, it, it's going to, a Sasquatch look like they're, looks like they're gliding. Mm -hmm. And it's just, their, their weight is carrying them over that fulcrum, that center of gravity. And then they on to the next step and it, without a lot of forward speed. It's still uh, bringing a tremendous amount of weight down on a single foot. Oh, it is. You wouldn't want her to step on your, no, your toes. Def definitely not. Well, the, the Patterson Giblin film broke so much ground. It involved, it, it, it was actually even compelling enough to involve people in, in uh, teaching positions and educated people like Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Uh, even uh, Jane Goodall has commented on the possibility of Bigfoot. Well, it's open some eyes, and it, you see the better stuff, the better versions of it. If there's anything that that I've had anything to do with, uh, it's trying to get it in its best form. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the with the defects out of it, and and one of them is what they call chromatic aberration. It's a de lensing defect 
-hmm. that contributes to the overall unsharpness of the film. Uh, it's it's uh, the separation of the colors and not all the colors being brought to a sharp focus. Uh, so you got some some colors that are very sharp and others that are that are blurred and they are all together in one image. So uh, if you can separate the colors and remove the ones that are unsharp, then you will have a sharper image. It, the true the color might be off but if you're looking for details the, the the image will be much sharper and and so that's that's i went frame by frame uh and 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 filtered every one of those frames and and boosted the sharpness uh because i was like uh, you guys and a lot of other people i wanted to know I thought the film, the film itself, would tell its own story. Uh, that it, it would not need anyone to, to give testimony if it were good enough. Yeah, you, you know. So uh, we see, we see in the film what the two men described was a huge muscles movie. I read a read an article one time. It was somebody that postulated that there was more than one creature there at that time. Do you think there's any truth to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I do think that. Uh, for one thing, uh, they, uh, Patterson and, and Gimlin both said that there were a set of three tracks down there. You know, uh, so, you know, that by itself, uh, and if you, if you look at the Patterson subject, her breasts are very heavy. Like she's nursing? Yeah, and 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 you know, experience tells you that that that's a likely the, re the reason why. Uh, it's 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 clearly they're clearly as dense as water anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when she would take a step, the breasts would be about a half step behind it in in reacting. You know, up mm -hmm. the up and down motion. Right. Uh, so that's about the density of water. So that that's that tells you a lot right there that she had she had a lot of milk in there mm -hmm. and 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 it was probably a small one around there somewhere and it, maybe even the daddy. Yeah, you know? I, my, a friend of mine and I, my friend Greg, in fact, the guy that just commented there said Jane Goodall's people wish she never would have said that. We watched the Patterson Gimlin footage together a long time ago, and I I had the impression like. Oh, and this is just my opinion. That I don't have anything to back that up besides my gut feeling. But I almost felt like she was distracting them. Like she'd glanced toward the trees a couple of times and kept walking like she was trying to draw them away from maybe where the, the infant, the, the child was hidden. Yeah. Uh, the, the, some of the testimony they gave, they said that she looked back at them twice. And if you take the very, the film is in two sections. And when you look at the first section, uh, it's, it's a little bit blurred, but you can see her turn her body halfway around and look back. And when, you know, in my, in my estimation, uh, it says my phone is overheating. Mm. Uh, in my estimation, uh, that, that appears to me the same way. That's the impression I get is that she's trying to make sure. Oh, we just lost him. Well, um, while we, well, since we lost him, his phone's overheating, we can answer this question here. Um, I don't know what, what your thoughts on it, RDA, or, or you, Roger, but I know for a fact that the forest reclaims its, its own. Um, different animals will eat the, uh, the flesh, the organs, the bones. Even deer will eat bones found in the forest. It's all for the, uh, the calcium. For the yeah, well, and, and the other minerals, too. Now, in reference to Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you want to call them by name, uh, there have been theories that they do bury their own. Mm -hmm. So they would not leave one of their own dead around. They would take, you know, go back and take the one away, and they would bury him somewhere somehow, and well, they, I, they have their own procedures I, I, there. I would use the example of, of bears. Uh, grizzly bears, black bears, whatever type of bear is in your right. area. 
Uh, I've, I grew up deer hunting. I spent a lot of time in the woods, uh, sometimes just hiking, sometimes just out goofing around. Um, but I have never come across a bear skeleton. I know a few people that have come across partial skeletons of bears, but it's very, very rare that they find a bear, even a partial bear skeleton, and we know they exist. It's, a, it's extremely rare, and yeah, we do know they exist. Uh, we had a bear, there's a uh, federal, state, federal and state park, maybe a uh, thousand feet from where I live, that's where it, where it starts anyway, um, and inside there was a black bear, there was a dead black bear, a very old dead black bear that uh, we came across because the, the odor was absolutely foul. It was uh, July of last year, you know, at the, at the height of our COVID and everything. And uh, this thing was eaten upon by buzzards. And the buzzards were in the tree and they were on the ground and they were taking their turns. And then when the buzzards weren't there, there, were, there was other animals that went by. And I actually saw a, a large um, buck walking away with a bone in its mouth. And that was simply amazing to me to see something like that happen. Welcome back, sir. Oh, All righty. I went and got a small fan and <laughs> took my phone out of the case. And uh, so I got it blowing on me. So maybe it won't overheat anymore. Well, keep your fingers crossed. All right. We are, we are picking a little background noise, but it's not too bad. Okay. I was going to ask you that next. That's it's a fan. Pretty quiet fan. <laughs> Sounds like we're in a, um, an aquarium with the bubbles. <laughs> it does kind of. It's, it's, it's high tech, low tech, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> low, a low tech solution for a high tech problem. There you go. Sometimes low tech works the best. Um, one of the questions right before we lost you was from Sean Buster. He said, What would you say to all the skeptics to say if they exist, we would have found bones? Well, I mean, I, I don't know what to say about that except that I think that they probably have found bones. They, they were either misidentified or either just put in somebody's basement. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been several instances where they found giant skulls. They found the minaret skull. Uh, it was had huge brow ridges, and uh, uh, the Boy Scouts were on an expedition, and a, a mule kicked it up out of a bog, uh, and it went to a museum, and that was the last they seen of it. There have been a number of incidents reported where large bones were found and given to the Smithsonian, then gone. Yeah. So my advice to anybody, if you find a Sasquatch anything, <laughs> don't give it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> no kidding. No. Not if you want to ever see it again. And that's the problem, you know, Mr. Davis. Uh, when you find hair, when you find bones, uh, the... The organization I work for, uh, the NADP, we actually have what we believe is a dogman, part of uh, a dogman's, uh, I guess it would be the right-hand side uh, of the jawbone with a, a large canine there too. But we don't know who we can actually trust to give it to, to have it really tested out because we've sent hair samples out and they've turned up missing. Uh, we had a bone sample we sent out, nothing. They said, oh, we don't even have it. I say that's BS because we have receipts that say that the place received it. So it's like, who Who do you turn to? I mean, you, you need a really trusted person to, to, to give this you know, the fines to, that is. Well, I'll give an example. The, the last truly wild Indian, in other words, uh, excuse me, no con a no contact person, uh, came out of the woods in 1911. And they called him Ishi. That wasn't his name. He, he never gave them his name. But he lived three years before he died from tuberculosis. And he was he lived in the Phoebe Hearst Museum in, uh, in uh, California, in Berkeley. And when he passed away, his wish was to be interred, not to be autopsied, because he, his religious beliefs were that all his body had to be whole. And uh, anthropologist Orrin Starn was doing some research and came across 
Alfred Kroger's correspondences with the Smithsonian. Alfred Kroger was the keeper, caretaker for Ishii. He was an anthropologist. And in that correspondence, he said that he sent them Ishii's brain. Oh. And so, and so Oren Starn turned that into the local tribes. And they got it, and they made a request that the brain be returned. And the Smithsonian denied having it. And they got a lawyer and produced it in court, the evidence, and the Smithsonian sent them a brain. Whether it was the right one or not, who knows? It, was, it, yeah. came, from, it came from a vat with 35 other brains floating around in it. Who knows where they came from? Exactly. Why would they put them all in the same vat? My God. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, they're not a scientific institution. They're a collecting institution. Mm -hmm. And if you have to kind of remember that, they uh, they employ scientists, but ultimately they're, they're there to collect. Uh, and so uh, they have over 18,000 Native American skeletons in their basement. And, and they've collected them by digging up graves for the last hundred years or so. And uh, some of them are, are ancient. Some of them are modern. They're somebody's grandpa. You know, uh, they, they kind of went indiscriminately did it because at one time they, they, they believed in uh, what you call a eugenics theory that you could tell a person's intellectual ability or potential by the shape of his head. Phrenology. Yeah. So they, a matter of fact, they advised the government when the, we were fighting the Japanese on the potential of the Japanese, you know, whether they could figure this out or that out. It was all bunk. Uh, but they're, they're exempt from having to return those skeletons. Uh, everybody else has to return theirs for reburial, but not the Smithsonian. So if you give them something that they're not, there's no law to protect you or anything. If they're not giving it back. They're, they're probably not going to give it back and not, not willingly. Uh, so that that's unfortunate, but I do, I do want to uh, give them some credit in the guy that's running it now. Uh, Stanford seems to be a lot more open-minded, uh, better than than past uh, past people they've had. Uh, they they had a guy named Alice Herlishka who was their first anthropologist, and he had no degree at all. He came over here from Bohemia and tried to get on with the Smithsonian. They wouldn't hire him, no. so he goes back to Bohemia and gets him a degree. In, in anthropology from somewhere over there. Uh, he comes back with it. They still wouldn't hire him. So he goes to the American Museum and he offers to work for free. And so they use him to, to do digging and stuff. And so he takes that and he puts that on his resume and he finally gets hired and he becomes uh, just like, uh, you know, he... He just beats down all the competition and becomes head of the department. And uh, close, uh, close to a real life Dr. Frankenstein as you could ever get. Uh, I don't know how how we end up with people like that running these places, but uh, yeah, he he went down to Mexico after an earthquake and picked up a dead little dead baby with the mother standing right there. And just threw it out in the road like it was a sack of potatoes, you know. Uh, so, yeah, the guy that's running it now, he's way better than that. Good. But it doesn't take much to be better than that. Wow. <laughs> Greg Price says the Smithsonian is notorious for losing problematic finds. Uh, Sean Bustard says, "Evening, gentlemen. I think we're, I think Sean's tuning out for the night." Um, Josh, uh, Josh Jones says, "I think this one's for you, Nick." He said, "Send it to the research team that ran Skinwalker Ranch," and then Greg makes the comment, "Top men." 
No, definitely not. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I, you know, I, I don't I don't know too much about the TV people, you know, the TV uh, projects they have. Uh, I, I will say this, that television by and large is willing to entertain the, the more esoterical things than they did used to would even air. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, at least to that extent, you know, it's better than it used to be. But I don't know if you're getting true science out of any of that. You know, it's all it's all entertaining. It's all about ratings. <laughs> yeah. Josh says he was just joking. <laughs> Skinwalker Ranch. I've read the book. You know, it's, it's an interesting a, place. I would like to go there. Yeah, it's a scary place too. Uh, what they say. Uh, I don't know if anything's still going on like that, but. Uh, Gosh, you know, to, you know, to see some of those things they they describe there, it's that that's where you, you get into the uh, you know the, the paranormal aspect of bigfooting. You know, it's uh, it's it's almost inevitably attached to, uh, you know, the the, the high, high strangeness. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're talking about something that's 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 got a body that's so dense that it weighs double what we weigh. It's 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 like us, but it's not exactly us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's got some internals that are different. And, and and when you talk about the brain and all of that, we really don't know what they're capable of. You know, uh, and and that whole area at the Bluff Creek, like from from Bluff Creek to Mount Shasta, is all interconnected with underground tunnels uh, and lava tubes, things like that. And, and so, you know, the, the strangeness around Mount Shasta, I don't know, you, you probably, if you haven't read about it, you can just type it in to Google. It's some really wild things that people have claimed to have seen at Mount Shasta. Um, well, amongst them, Bigfoot. Yeah. Um, so it's about 70 miles as the crow flies from uh, the Bluff Creek drainage to Mount Shasta. Uh, so they, that's all high, high strange area. Uh, and and I've, I've experienced some high strangeness out there. I, I've had electronic equipment malfunction. I've had autofocus wouldn't focus, you know, and, and when we left the area, it all went back to working correctly. Uh, I've had the temperature of the ground be 100 degrees uh, uh, going up some of those slopes, you know, to the ridges. Right. Uh, things like that. Uh, when you look at the Patterson subject, especially in the early part, I call sequence one. Uh, of the film when the Patterson is directly behind her and below her, you can see the, the, the cleavage in her rear end and the hair is worn away on her buns toward the inside. So it tells me something. It tells me that she spent an inordinate amount of time scooting about on her rear end, which gives you a little bit of a clue as to the environment she might have been in. Uh, an area with with probably not as much headroom, uh, you know, uh, kind of an overhang or a cave, right. or a tube, a tube, something like that. Mr. Uh, Davis, uh, I I just like to ask, I did interrupt, but any way we might be able to see some of the the cleared up film that you have today by any chance? Yeah, I've, I've got a uh, website. It's called the Davis Report. Oh, wow. Uh, it's the Davis Report .wordpress com, and some of the best stuff on the film is on there. And you may have to hunt for it because I just keep putting it up in in chronological order. Right. I'm sorry. The, the, the Davis Report. The Davis Report dot wordpress dot com. It's all small small letters. All together. There you go. All right, thank you, sir. That's the latest thing I posted. I posted it today. I was looking at that just earlier today. You can see the movement of the mouth. Yeah. 
uh, it's, it's, you know, the quality is of the film is, uh, there, there's the original had a, a probably almost double that resolution, mm -hmm. but even on, even on that generated copy, you can still see the, the movement of the jaw and the mouth mm -hmm. when, you, when you stabilize it. That's a that's another copy that I I posted. Um, that ca that came from the World Wildlife Federation, and I did a little little looping file there so you could see the muscles in the legs and stuff. It's it's got kind of a or if kind of faded to red. You mean run that again? Yeah, you can you can run with it much as you want. It's a uh, yeah, look at that. It's it's, a, it's you could stay on that site for a while with the Patterson stuff. A lot of good stuff there. Um, see how stable that is the background, yeah. and yeah, you can see the movement. If I was going to fake a suit, I certainly probably I don't think I would try to fake one that had breasts. Yeah, I was just going to say that I would have just gone with a male one. It's a lot easier. Well, wow. what, you, what what you see on the Patterson film that indicates that it's not fake uh, is is uh, not only because it's so clear. I think there you see the thumb motion, don't you? Yeah. Um, it's a uh, it's the duration of the film. Typically, a hoaxer will not allow you to look at it, but but a second. Is that so? Are we seeing eye shine there? Uh, there, there? There does seem to be some eye glow. Uh, I've got a filtered image of frame. I believe it's frame 62. Oh, no, frame uh, 64. Um, you, you can probably find it there on the Davis report. Uh, and the eye does appear to glow. Uh, and as we all know, humans don't have eye shine. But no, that's a know. that's another thing that that is kind of you know points to something different yes, rather exactly. than us. Yeah. Hmm. And that one right there, you you see a, an object in the left hand is kind of a white looking, uh, uh, right along the leg. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? Do you think? That's why the Russian said that the, her left hand doesn't move much. She's uh, carrying they something. That. Uh, I picked it up again later in the film, and it's pretty good size. It it looks to be about the size of a of a catcher's mitt. Um, it's uh, uh, it could be anything uh, in 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 the wild. Uh, it's common to carry what they call a parfletch. Um, a parfletch would be uh, any. It's made of leather or cloth, mm -hmm. and it's just folded over objects that you and then rolled up or folded. This uh, to help carry. Uh, I I don't know for sure, uh, but but I just you know uh, I have to make a note of it. You know that it is yeah. in the film. There it is, right there. That's when I told you I found it again. Mm -hmm. Not to be funny, but she it is a female, and uh, most females like to carry a purse. So <laughs> he's carrying yeah. things, that probably is it. You know, some sort of uh, a skin, a hide from a deer or something, and fold it over. Yeah, well, there doesn't seem to be anything in her hand in this one. Yeah. No. No, because she's carrying it with a lanyard. It's it's got a lanyard around her neck. I picked it up in several frames. Uh, it's 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 just it's like a homemade satchel. Wow. Yeah, it's 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 like a it's like a satchel. It's got a little small lanyard that uh, maybe I'll show it later on if you go down. It may show in some of this. I don't know. If not, I can. This are some of the higher quality uh, inserts into the film. I just put them in their proper places. Uh, 
Oh, that's a good look at the face right there. Yeah. Oh, there. That, that's that's even better. You can see the mouth. Mouth. Okay. Lip. Uh, that that one you just looked at is the one that has the eye glow. Let me see if I can get it back and stop it. That brings a whole new thing to the, to that film now. Showing the eye glow. Showing the uh, what is, is that? Is, is that the spot? No, it's one back. I think. Yeah. Go back. I think that's it. Yeah, you can see something up near the eye. Well, you have to look at the filtered image. It shows it real well. Uh, it, it when when you're talking about, I, I know that, that one of the names that Native Americans had for them were moon-eyed people. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Several of the tribes would call them that. And it's funny that tribes that had no contact, east and west coast tribes, describe similar creatures. They do. Well, I mean, how do you explain that? You know, I mean, we're talking 3,000 miles away from each other, and they're saying the same exact thing. My research has shown the exact same thing you just said. Unbelievable. Look at that. That's the first walk sequence right there. You see how wild it was. I, I stabilized the, the the image and just let the perimeter to go where it wanted to go, you know? Yeah. That's a black and white. Look at the stride. Look at the stride on that. Well, and on a, on a human, especially somebody that's, you know, sedentary, that you would see a certain amount of jiggle in the thighs as they walked, but look how thick and powerful those thighs are, and there's they're solid. They don't shake at all. Oh, remember, their 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 bones are super dense, and they're all muscle. There's no fat on these things. Yeah, there's not much fat on it. There are no. I mean, what do they eat that's fat wise? I mean, nothing. They don't you know, have cherry pie and you know donuts and things. It's like, <laughs> oh man, MK, you've oh, done God. an amazing job on these. These are beautiful. Well, thank oh, there's you. a thylacine. It, it uh, yeah, I, I I worked on that a little bit too. I wanted to uh, to I, I used a new processing technique that took the flicker out of it. Mm -hmm. And what it did was give it lifelike motion, you know, without any, because this whole film, taken at slow shutter speeds, you know, sh slow frame rates. So I got I got the it, it's it's more smooth now and you can kind of look look oh, in that look mouth at that mouth man how, wow. look how wide it thing can open its mouth look the tongue the tongue is very different very different from a canine tongue oh let me tell you what that thing will rip you to pieces I if bet it would I could put a whole it. put your whole head in its mouth looks like it has a bite pressure of about 500, 600 pounds my God. And they were they were more than willing to bite. As a matter of fact, uh, nice puppy. <laughs> they uh, that one right there bit the guy, the cameraman. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can find. Uh... No, you're not. <laughs> it's like mm -mm. <laughs> hold on here. I should have. Second quality. There we go. All right, this is a filtered image. I'm on. I, I don't know if I can turn this around and show this or not. Let me try. Let me, uh, let me, uh, oh, I'm, look at that thing! I'm trying to get around. You notice to the it. back legs on that da? On that? That what do you call it? The thylacine? Thylacine. Yeah. Did you notice how the back legs are? Yeah. The knees are forward like yours and mine. So if it wanted to, it could probably walk up right. Look at that that image there on that MMK's got though. That's unbelievable. Let me go back to it again. Hold on. If you'll if you'll notice around the neck, you'll see that lanyard right there pulling on the skin. Yeah, you need to move to your right just a little bit. We can't really see it. Kind of cutting off. There we go. I see it. I see what you're talking about. You're right looks, under the yeah. chin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Wow. 
this this puts a whole new slant on it. We're talking about a little bit more intelligence than your average bear here. Yeah, yeah, a whole a lot. lot more. Well, that that that's that's why you can't find them because they're not a bear. <laughs> no, uh, no, not at all. Like I said, I my theory is that they sleep, you know, during that daytime and at night they're out hunting and probably an anomaly Look yeah that. Uh, that, it, it's a uh, and like uh, you're you you went to uh, you got a degree in in cryptozoology so you know uh, about a uh, like like the thylacine there yes sir there, there are people who hunt thylacines every day trying to rediscover them and they they the general theory is and it's like a lot of animals uh, when when they become pressured or when they become uh, they feel like their world is closing in, they go into a nocturnal mode. They won't come out in the daytime. Well, look at the panda bear. It took them 65 years after they saw the first one to actually find one. And the guy looking for it died before he found it and his wife found it. Unbelievable. This one shows wow. the leg bulge. Yes, look at that. What do you think that is? Well, there's a lot of theories, but uh, I just I'm, just, I'm I'm satisfied to say I'm it's sufficient to say that it is a bulge from something. You know, uh, previous it, wound it, or something. It exists for one frame, and then she turns away, so where you can't see the leg anymore. So. Uh, if if it if it shows in anywhere else, you don't know because yeah, you see the slow motion there. That was the new processing. Look at that. See that slow motion? How smooth it is. Mm -hmm. Right. the The original film was shot at sixteen frames per second, or slightly less, and it it had a lot of flicker. Mm -hmm. And I was able to reprocess it to get the flicker out. You know, I'm thinking it might be the uh, the muscle clature yeah. on this uh, creature here. The thigh muscle, as with regular humans that have the knees forward, the thigh muscle is generally larger than the hamstring muscle uh, because it's you know a lot less used. I'm wondering if uh, due to the environmental area that these creatures climb a lot which would increase the muscle clature of the, uh, the thigh muscle, you know, the top thigh. Yeah, that, that goes back to the female nature of it. Yeah, and most females do have larger thighs than males. Now, there's something. Oh, oh the this is the Russian, the, the, the Yeti. Yeah, it's that ah. sta stabilized. People ask me about that, and I, I say, well, uh, I, I'll leave it up to Russian colleagues over there to sort it out. Uh, Looks I, pretty I put, realistic to me. Yeah, I put it in, a, in the best form that I could, uh, and it look here, it's bugging and through that deep snow. It's kicking that snow way back. Yeah, and the stride length is pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I uh, it, there again, you don't get a lot of opportunity to see it very long. It cuts, you know, cuts on out of there pretty fast. But do we know what they're following them uh, on? Is that a, a snowmobile? No, it's a. They're in a vehicle. Oh, they're uh, in a vehicle. Yeah, it's a dash cam. Russians like their dash cams. Yeah, and they sure got a set of uh, brass ones to be going after a Yeti. <laughs> I, but I, I don't under I don't think that they were pursuing a yeti. I think that they ran oh, across man. it. Look at oh my god! See it kicking that snow. Look at yeah. the stride going through snow. The stride. I mean, if you've ever run through snow, you know how hard it is. Yeah, and he's yeah. still covering a hell of a lot of distance through deep that snow. That thing is covering distance like a, a track athlete on just on a track. It crossed that road in two bounds, and that's the width of a car, at least. I'm, I'm gonna tell you what, I, you know, that's that's not 32 degree snow either. 
That's uh, art of the Siberian Arctic cold. I know. Yeah. Uh, it, it didn't act like it was very cold. Uh, you know, it, it was plenty limber. <laughs> Jeez. Uh. Those are all really very interesting things to me. And uh, Oh, me too. That's on the other side of the world, but still. Yeah, very uh, similar to what we're finding here. It's kind of similar, yeah. I think that shows the breast jiggling, I think, don't it? Yeah, sure it does. They're not just cotton. Yeah. <laughs> no. That shows a little braid of hair, what looks like a braid. You can see the ear right there. Uh huh. Now, it could be a dreadlock. Yeah. A lot of the research I've done on, on Sasquatch, uh, believe it or not, has, has brought up the fact that Sasquatch in the area have gone into the barns where their horses are held up or, and they would braid the hair on the horses. Yeah, I, you don't, 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 I don't see don't. how a horse would stand for that, but that makes sense yeah. if that's a braid. Don Monroe has got a, a whole a whole suitcase full of uh, manes that he's had clipped off that were braided. Why do you think they do that to horses? Uh, the horse seems to let them do it for some reason. Practice. Uh, that, that's Ishii right there. That's the guy I was telling you about, Ishii, that they took his brain and sent mm -hmm. it to the Smithsonian. you notice he's plucking the string with his thumb. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the only people who did that were Mongolians. There were no other Native American groups or tribes that did that. Hmm. Mongolians had a thumb ring, a wooden ring they put on their thumb and plucked the, th the string. Mr. Davis, why did they take, take his brain? Why did they want his brain specifically? Because they knew he was different. Ah, okay. Well, that proves it right there. It's one of the things that would prove it. Uh, using the thumb technique to shoot a bow and arrow. I know as a child, I used to use uh, the forefinger and the thumb to pull it back. And then I learned, you know, do it the right, the other right. That's, uh, that is something. Now that's oh, the eye that's, showing on that thing. That's the Mayaka skunk ape right there. Yeah. They're taken in Florida. It was uh, taken in a lady's backyard, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Oh, uh, there's some Kennedy stuff. Mm -hmm, from the Zapruder film? Yeah, it was clips from it. I used that processing technique and uh, was able to smooth it out. It's just not a, it's not a pretty thing to see. No. Yeah, you can clearly see the moment of impact there. Yeah. That's brutal. But going back to the skunk cave, I mean, clearly, that's, you know, you don't fake the eye shine. No, you most certainly do not. Oh, man. Uh, I think uh, it, was, it had, a, it had a, a significant amount of eye shine. Well, I could spend hours just on your on your uh, website there. Uh, yeah, we'll that's get back what I was to... saying. It's it's got a lot of good stuff on there. Uh, we've got some questions lined up while we were uh, while we were looking at the video. Uh, Greg Price says, "What's going to happen to the field of crypto when the current generation passes on? Seems like the kids are more interested in laughing than researching." Yeah, I guess you got a good point there. I thought about that often. Well, you know what? There's always people that are more serious. Then uh, and they have a, a different need than just to play with their, their computer games and stuff like that. You always you're always going to have people that are interested in that. I, I tell you something. A lot of people that go into crypto zoology 
do so as a result of a personal experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if you have, if you see one yourself uh, and, and you don't have anybody to talk to or, you know, you, I've seen people just take it up. You know, I, 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 I want to prove it. I want people to understand what it was that I saw. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it happens, I guess. But uh, and then there's other other people like, you know, uh, Rene DeHinden, you know, mm-hmm. the Canadian. He wanted it to, to find one for the money. Yeah. You know, he thought it was some big money to be had or made. And uh, that was his driving force. Yeah. Sean Bussard says, just like any other type of animal, do you believe there's an alpha or be- or because they travel in pairs? That's a good question. Um, I don't know if there really is an alpha in, the, in a sense like uh, an alpha uh, wolf. You know, wolf or something. Well, you uh, know what? In, in any group, you're going to have a leader. You're going to have a leader in, as in any group. And, uh, yeah, there probably is an alpha someplace. If they have a group of more than two, you know somebody has to be the leader. There probably there probably is whatever whatever's kind of social structure they may have. You know, there's probably somebody that calling the shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, but the, you know that remains to be seen. Uh, without without subjects to study, it's hard to say. It's. And, and th- that's where you run into problems uh, on our end as interested people or, or, or researchers uh, is that we, we become used to a scheme or, a, or, or a, maybe a framework of, our under, of understanding that we, f- we assume or figure happens. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of times people are highly resistant to any other ideas, even if the other ideas may be correct. Uh, you know, they just, you know, if someone is convinced like it's a gorilla, you know, they really don't want to hear, or a lot of them don't want to hear any hypothesis about it being some kind of primitive person. Which way do you come down? Do you think it's do you think it's an ape or do you think it's a a relic hominid? I don't think that it's an ape or a gorilla. Uh, even even the most uh, rarest of the apes that we can still go and we can locate them and find them. Silverback uh, gorilla. Yeah. I, I think that it is a person, a human, but not not a sapient human, not sapiens. Maybe like a relic of Neanderthal? Some kind of a relic or, or, or something like that. Because of its unusual physical, physical attributes, its density, right. uh, its muscle density, and, and the glowing eyes, and, and the things that are reported like that, uh, the high strangeness that's reported about them. Uh, I don't think it's us. Yeah. We're not looking at a, a version of us. Uh, it, it's it's so unlike us that they don't even think they 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 they, they feel no kinship to us. Well, they they've got to be close enough genetically where they're at least similar. Uh, then you get the reports out of Russia, like uh, Zana, that they thought was a uh, a hybrid. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of lot of reports from uh, of uh, of uh, accounts from Native Americans about females being carried off. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the the Patterson subject is probably a hybrid. Uh, it's probably not. Uh, if you look at the hair coverage and everything, it's 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 pretty uh, pretty patchy. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at the the Paul Freeman video, I, I believe that to be more in line with what a Bigfoot is, mm-hmm. uh, and and Patty. From what what the what the native peoples told me, and I spent a good deal of time on the Hooper reservation, is that is that the the kidnappings that took place, and and also there were ten thousand Chinese in there doing the hydraulic gold mining mm-hmm. during the eighteen forties, that it provided a lot of opportunity for that type of thing to occur. 
uh, there was a there was a bear hunter who encountered a group of Sasquatch, uh, and he put his rifle scope on them, and he says some were covered in hair, and others were hairless, and they were all together. So, it, 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 I believe what the Hoopa said is true that 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 the the true the true Bigfoot is a rarer thing than in at least in the Bluff Creek area. You see a, more of the type like what Patty is there that are kind of hybridized. Uh, they don't have the, the full complement of hair that a Bigfoot would have. Uh, or, or nor the size. Uh, the foot looks normal on Patty. It looks like a big version of our feet. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Paul Freeman's tracks, the the toes are splayed, and and they're they're more forward on the foot, and the foot is an hourglass shape. Uh, so uh, I, I believe that there's probably something to that, and that. There are cases where down the line, generations ago, human and Bigfoot managed to to have a viable offspring together. And uh, that would explain know, for different types in different areas as well. Right, exactly. I just they don't they're not all the same. Uh, you know, you may you may find one that looks so much like a human that it may not draw a lot of attention if you've got a set of clothes for it. There, there have been hunters' accounts that said they put a like a deer, like a rifle scope on one and didn't pull the trigger because they thought it was a person. You're right; it looks so human. But you look at the one there on the Paul Freeman, uh, taken up in the the Blue Mountains mm -hmm. above Walla Walla, Washington, and it it, it looks as as uh, uh, it looks like a you know like some. A brute, brutish look, you know. Uh, so, but if you if you melded if you melded the two between a human woman and that, you would get something like Patty, right? You know, uh, which is what the the hoopas told me. Um, I, some of the accounts, especially uh, like the uh, Bella Coola up in up in uh, British Columbia. They were saying it was just they, they treated them just like another tribe, uh, as if they were another tribe of Native Americans that lived in that lived in the mountains, and cautioned people to not go up there because they they would get aggressive. Well, you gotta you gotta understand that the very fact that they cautioned people meant they weren't treating them like a just another tribe. Yeah. <laughs> they they knew that they were that they they had they had some particular things about them that that you could get in trouble with them. They may still be yeah. going on today. I mean, look at the stretch of highway in Canada where so many Native American women have gone missing over the last decade. I, I won't say that they're the reason, but I, I won't say that they're not. Mm -hmm. Kind of like uh, have you have you uh, watched any of the missing four one one series? I have. I've watched some of those. It's, those are heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. They the ones are. That, the ones I find most compelling are, is the the series The Hunters, uh, where you've got armed men who were experienced and knew the area that gone without a trace. Yeah, how does that happen? Yeah, people that hunted that area for years and knew it like the back of their hand. They're not going to just climb out of their deer stand and go wander off. And speaking of hunters with like scopes and everything, Mr. Davis, I just want to get your opinion on this because my research has shown quite a bit of the thing, a thing called mind speak. Uh, I, I have research that shows a hunter or a man with a gun, he's out in the woods and he puts a scope on a Sasquatch and in his mind it says, don't, you know, and uh, another fellow in his mind, it says, if you, f if you shoot, we will kill you, you know, plain and simple. Uh, that he gets the. It's called mind speak. You have you ever hear, come across anything like that? I, I have, you know, I, I've I've been. I started my foray into this field uh, back in the mid '90s, so I've been doing it for a while, and I've I've come across a lot of things, uh, and and I've learned I've learned that. 
I don't, I don't, I don't want to be amongst those who have a lockdown framework of yes, what, right. because they, I think that that will prevent you in some cases from, uh, I, you, you, you need to be able to be right about some things. Uh, you don't need to be so afraid of being wrong that you're afraid to be right. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, I take people's word for it. Somebody says, I heard this in my mind. I take their word for it. I can't possibly get in their head to verify anything. Yeah. So uh, and, and unless I have a re reason to disbelieve, I believe it. I, I take them at their word for it. Right. And, and I always make notes uh, of what people say about it and then later on if there any more information comes in I, I try to try to put it all together because ultimately you're putting a puzzle together mm -hmm. my research and, has shown well over 120 reports and it's probably minuscule compared to what's out there of people saying the exact same thing of the mind speak you know yeah. where they're told to stop and don't don't come after me you know, just stay where you are or don't shoot, uh, something like that. But I've got over 120. And like I said, it, it's probably not even the, the tip of the iceberg on that. Well, you know, I told you about the bear, you know, yeah. that I encountered. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, for a split second there, we, I understood that bear. Of one we looked, life. We yeah. looked right at, right at each other, right dead in the eye. And I think that he understood me, too. And uh, if it, it's one of those things where, where uh, God, our Creator, put in us when we're born, you know, the ability, some innate ability to read another individual. Oh, yeah. You know, whether it be body language or his eyes or, or whatever. And, uh, and, and, and to us, in a sense, that you could say that could be a form of like mind speak because it's unspoken. Right. Uh, he didn't speak anything, and I didn't speak anything other than to say bear. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of funny because my friend who was behind me about 30 yards, his nickname was Bear. He <laughs> thought I was talking to him. <laughs> I said, Bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It all happened so fast that you know, uh, we he probably the bear would have eaten us both if he wanted us. But uh, I understood it. I understood the bear, and and so in that sense, I know that mind speak, whatever it is, can exist. Yeah, right. even if it's just like on an instinctual level. If it's on a, pr a primitive level. Of understanding, you know, it's not complex language, but you know, you probably showed no fear. You just showed surprise, and you stood your ground, and he understood you weren't trying to harm him, and he just went on his way. I understand That's that that primitive instinct. I've gone to a few places looking looking to look into local legends and stuff, and you just get that feeling at the back of your skull, like I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> And uh, I, I listen to my gut when that happens. I don't press on. If I just get that, that nagging feeling at the back of my head, like I really shouldn't be here, I will back away slowly. Did you have it that night with you and Steve, DA? Or No, I didn't feel a thing. No? No, wow. we were just out there shooting a promo for my books. Uh, no. MK, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with my work. I, 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 I'm, I've been a... I, I I hate to use the word cryptozoologist because that seems to to be to me to be reserved for guys like like yourself who have done so much in the field. But I've since I was a young man, I've gone now gone out and looked in the woods and checked places and talked to locals and uh, taken accounts. And I, I I read I read hundreds and hundreds of accounts that I find online or or you can find on websites. Um, I, I research the field almost constantly, but. I, I took it to a different direction. I write fiction, uh, and I use the accounts that I've read and the things I've learned to make the behaviors as believable as possible in the books I write. And um, it, it, so far, it's been pretty. It's worked out fairly well for me. Um, I would say so. 
<laughs> but I, yeah, I, like I said, I've taken it a different direction. I don't write nonfiction books. I don't write like a, the field guide to cryptozoology or anything like that. Uh, I write horror and, uh, and I enjoy it. It's stories I like to tell. Um, but I, 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 again, I use those, those, those encounters to base the, 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 the behaviors. But that, that is because the, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. True. <laughs> Very true. Does yeah, the Dennis, it, it, I, I call him the uh, Tom Clancy of cryptozoology because he does such deep and precise research in in when he when he writes his books. I'm, I'm going to tell you, he he's well, he's got a, a very large following over the last few months. I can't tell you how many how many problems have been solved by people who are intuitive. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and and that's a, a form of intuition where you take the real experiences and then you 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 turn them into a, a kind of a predictive work uh, that uh, that points the way down a road. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, even though it's fiction, it it can still point you down the road to go. And how many how many good writers have done that uh, over the years? By uh, by, the, like Star Trek, for instance, the the communicator. Mm -hmm. oh, somebody yeah. somebody wrote that as fiction, but now we're talking over a communicator. Exactly. You know, so it, it's 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 a it's a a skill and a field where people like yourself and others have become the sages of our day through fiction. I spent most of my adult life in, in one uniform or another, most of, most of the time in law enforcement. Um, and I, that's the way I approach my writing from an evidentiary standpoint. And when I read accounts where they talk about mind speak, and then you've got some accounts where they talk about a cloaking ability, and some people think that they sh they change dimensions, I don't I don't I don't dismiss that. Uh, but I'm, I I I I deal more in physical evidence mentally myself, uh, so I won't ever say that can't happen. But I, I tend to examine the things that you can tangibly touch and take those more more credibly. Um, but I don't dismiss the the possibility of the others. I mean, I've never experienced mind speak. Anything I've I've experienced has just been my own brain telling me this is a bad spot. You probably shouldn't be here. Uh, but I'm not saying that you know I might turn a corner one day and run into one and just hear get out in my head. And and at that point, I'm probably going to take its advice. Uh, but yeah, so I won't dismiss that. Uh, and and the the, the how I view uh, what people refer to refer to as the cloaking ability is I got a buddy that's an army ranger and he, he, he was wearing his gear one day and uh, I, I told him, I said, how easy is it for you to hide from me? And he goes, all right, I want you to watch me. And he was standing near the edge of the woods and he took a step back and I could still see him. He took another step back and I could still see him. He took another step back and hit the tree line and I could still see him. He took another step and he was gone. Do you know that that actually happens in the uh, Paul Freeman video mm -hmm. where where the thing is walking and it stops and looks back at him and then you can't see it anymore. Yeah. And he, when when he, Mike didn't want to be seen, you couldn't find him. And, that, uh, and that we're talking about a creature that's born to that environment. So its ability to hide is probably astronomically higher than our ability. Was he wearing a ghillie suit at the time? Nope, just camouflage. Oh, just camo. If mm -hmm. he had to kill it, he would have probably disappeared sooner then. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the mind speak is one thing and the cloaking is another, but like infrasound, which they've also been credited with uh, using, is something you can actually experience. Oh, yeah, there are, a lot, there are a number of animals in the animal kingdom yeah. that, that use infrasound. Elephants, the tiger, the tiger, tigers, lions. The top one. Yeah. I mean, you go to a zoo, and if it's looking at you bad and it doesn't want you there, and that growl that it puts out, you can feel it all the way down in, inside your chest. I mean, it's it's something to behold. It really is. Well, the military has infrasound that will rip your guts out. Oh, yes, I sir. Mean, it, it, they, they have got the frequency and the amplitude that it will absolutely tear you up from the inside. Um, 
So yeah, yeah, infrasound is. I, I believe that to be a component uh, of something very large. Mm -hmm. with, I went to know, a lecture one time when I was in college, and I was talking to the professor afterwards, and he was telling me about resonance frequencies. He said everything in existence has a resonance frequency, and if you hit that, it will shatter. He right. said that, and that, that applies to people, that applies to objects. Everything has a resonance frequency, and if you hit it, you can kill it. Yeah, I think it was uh, uh, Nikola Tesla who said that he could explode dynamite, and and he had knew exactly how long it took for it to go to the other side of the earth, through the earth, and back. And he said if he waited and timed it perfectly, he could explode another at the exact moment that it arrived back, and then they would compound one another or proliferate, and he could continue to do that until he could actually cause the entire earth to cleave in half. Wow. And Tesla probably could have done it. The man was brilliant. Um, yeah, he, if he, he understood that. What they call a wave, wave propagation, mm -hmm. right? I think is what he called it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you don't want to turn him loose with too much stuff. No. Sergio, no. I think you're absolutely correct. And uh, Yeah, pissing yourself when you're scared. Yeah, I've been in, the, been in that situation. Uh, Luis Noriega says, I know back in high school I wrote a paper on nuclear explosions, that purple potion in space after I graduated, and I found out they were experimenting with nuclear explosions for space travel. Yeah, yeah, I, I've read about that. Uh, actually blowing a bomb up to send you to the stars. Yeah, they uh, they actually postulated that in the um, the book Starship Troopers. They were using controlled nuclear explosions. They called it a Chernikov drive. <laughs> Problem is, you use it the wrong way, and your atoms go to the stars. <laughs> Pretty much, you're going to the stars, just not the way you planned. Uh, Sergio Lamelli asks, "Do you think that sirens use that infrasound to lure sa lure the sailors?" Well, that that's something I don't know. Uh, you know, that's a that's considered to be a myth. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe not so much, and we find out uh, as time goes by that a lot of our myths are rooted in in fact. In fact. So, yeah, it could have been something like that. But I'm open to that. But uh, need mm -hmm. more information. Precisely why I research myths and folklore and and things like that because there's always a tiny bit of truth in uh, in the folklore and the myth and the legends and everything. So it's just another pathway to follow, to you know, on our quest. Sometimes, can, sometimes it's more than a tiny bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything I could take out of it, I'll take. What do you think that the the, uh, the stick formations mean? Well, it, uh, it's got to be some form of communication, you know. Um, you know as to if is it true writing? I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, some people you can actually write in symbols, mm -hmm. you know. The hieroglyphs yeah. of the Egyptians are an example of that. Uh, they they used to have an early form of writing called ogham mm -hmm. that was done with sticks. The Celts or, Celts did yeah. the ogham. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that the, uh, the all those things are are to be explored. Uh, I think this if you find if you there's some things are inarguable. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you find a certain type of formation, you know that that the wind couldn't possibly. Oh, absolutely! You know, line, <laughs> somebody had to do it or uh, something. I have you a know? I have a good friend. His name's Robert Miller. He's listening to us tonight. He's in the Texas Big Thicket country right now, and he was messaging me earlier today. He went for a hike in the Big Thicket territory, and something was pacing him in the trees. And when he would stop, it would stop. And he was walking on pine needles, so he knew it wasn't an echo of his own footfalls. He said he was walking fairly, fairly quietly. And when he came back down the trail, there was a tree across it. That's, uh, that's textbook Bigfoot stuff. That's what I told him. Yeah, that, that you, I've heard of that many, many times. I, I, I know a man who went, he was hunting. He had a thirty out six rifle, mm -hmm. and he began something began tailing him just like that, exactly like that. He would stop, and it would stop, and he would hear it stop like a half step, you know, enough that he could hear it. Yeah, and all of a sudden he became overwhelmed with terror, right. and he just tore out running, and and 
he's got this rifle in his hand, but he don't even know he's got the rifle in his hand. He, mm -hmm. he, and he, he runs, he falls down an embankment and out into a gravel road and a pickup trucks coming by and picks him up and he's out of breath and he can't tell the man what he was running from or anything. And, and, uh, he told me that story. He just kept it to himself for years, but it, whatever it was, it, it produced an inordinate amount of terror in him. Mm -hmm. you know, Fight or flight he, response. He couldn't function. He couldn't, he couldn't think to use his rifle. You know, it's like the rifle was just secondary. You know, it was like, it, it wasn't anything that would, could help him. Yeah, I was deer hunting one time uh, near Eldridge, Missouri, out in the sticks. And my uncle had, well, uh, I think he had about 180 acres, and it was right up against 5,000 acres of conservation land. There was nobody on it but me. Uh, and I was in a deer stand, and I got a really good look at a t about a 12-point buck. He was a good-sized buck. And uh, he stepped out into the clearing, and I was, like, waiting for the perfect time. And I got the broadside shot, and uh, I was using a British 303 with a soft nose, so I knew if I got the good shot, he was going down. And I hit him, and he went straight to the ground. And before I could get out of the tree stand, he popped back up and started bounding off. Well, I got over there. I got over to where he dropped and to, to, to start my track, and I, I found what we refer to as lung butter on the ground, so I knew I got him good. Uh, you know, and there were large drops on the ground where he where he took off. So I knew I wasn't going to chase him far. So I start tracking him, and he drops down into a ravine that was pretty pretty steep, and I wasn't going to risk jumping down it. So I had to backtrack a little ways to get into that ravine to find a shallower spot to drop down. And I, I circled back to where I was, not far from where he dropped. I found where he had bedded down in a large in a large uh, dead leaves deadfall. And yeah, there was enough blood there. I, I knew he bled out, uh, but the deer was gone. There was no tracks. I circled out for 50 yards. I, I couldn't find another single drop of blood. The And this was not a, not a light deer. It was probably in the 200-pound range. So if it had been a cougar or a bear or coyotes, coyotes would have destroyed it on the spot. Right uh, there. Cougar would have dragged it. Bear would have dragged it. This was probably around a 200-pound deer, but it was gone. No sign of it. Never found it. That's That's I figured it was a Uber food delivery. You know, I've, heard, I've read a lot of accounts where hunters have said that that you know when they make a shot, it's almost like ringing a dinner bell. I've heard that too. Well, they're smart enough to know that. That's just it. Well, there was one account that I read. Uh, this was in northern Georgia, up in the mountains, and the, a guy in his deer stand who had gone out with his buddies, and there was another deer stand about a quarter mile away. Well, the individual, they heard him yell and they heard a gunshot. And by the time they got running, got down and ran down there, he was gone. But they found his rifle snapped over a tree. Oh. They never found him. Oh, wow. Mm. Mr. Davis, what about uh, the tree docks? Is that a form of communication, you think, used between Sasquatch? I, I think so. Uh, I don't know that they all are, but... You know, I think that uh, at least some of them are. Uh, it seems to be that way. Uh, uh, I've heard them myself, you know, um, and there'll be like one or two. It's never been a bunch. It's always just been one or two. One or two. And, and it, it, it seems to just give some direction. Ah, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Like, like a sentry checking in or something like that? Yeah, it's it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's like a uh, a code, some sort of a yeah, code. Well, if you don't want someone else to know you're in the woods, you know, you don't want to holler. Yeah. You know, uh, so you just wrap a tree, and and you know, you the odds are they won't figure out what you're, you know, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can see that being something usable you know for something that's that's that wants to remain hidden exactly right if i wanted to remain hidden i i you know you you want to the next sasquatch up on the other ridge you know you can just kind of let them know know where you're at you know mm -hmm. without alerting the entire forest yeah one uh, obscure knock is not going to be you know everything but they know the 
they would probably know from the pitch yeah. how hard it was hit that that's uh that's Harry and you know, this is Sam. Yeah, I've heard that 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 uh, there's some of those those uh, uh sticks that they use are tuned. Uh right. I've heard that before. Hmm. And I, when I, I heard a wood knock at Bluff Creek, uh, and it was just out of sight. You know, there's a lot of undergrowth there uh, at, down in the creek, and it, it was just out of sight through that undergrowth. But I could hear the, uh, the what do you call that, the resonation right. of the wood. Yeah. It kind of had a ring. Yeah. Uh, and then I got down real low, and I looked, peered, I peered up through the brush, and I could see a figure walking along the, the hillside. Uh, and and my friend that was with me said he could hear it mumbling, but I, uh, my ears were too bad. I, I've had a lifetime of working around loud equipment, and uh, I can't hear that well. Right. What's your take on the Sierra sounds? I think that they're the the closest thing you'll ever have. That they're the Patterson film version of audio. Yeah, well, we actually uh, have Ron Moorhead coming on the show next week, so I'm I'm really excited about that. It's uh he he lost some of his best stuff in a house fire. That's unfortunate. Oh. Wow. He uh, we can only be just grateful that they those people were curious enough and fearless enough to keep going up there and continue to get this audio because it it is no longer available they the, the sasquatch will not cooperate well um uh, when uh, my, my, my i told you about my friend that was in the big thicket today he described a call that he heard uh, kind of a he described it as almost a snort slash whoop but the the way he he repeated it to me on the phone when he when he got out of there, um, he he made the call and it sounded like something from the from the uh, Sierra sounds like one of the ah. The Sierra sounds they play so fast. Mm -hmm. the, the the actual vocalizations are so high speed that it's you cut it back to fifty percent in the in the speed. Mm -hmm. And it it sounds a whole lot more like language. Well, they they sent those to a, Na a navy crypto linguist, and he said this is a language. Yeah, I've met him, uh, Scott Nelson. I, I would like to meet him. I, he's going to be at a few conferences this year. I would like to get to. Uh, I'd love to meet him. Is that the yeah. porpoise guy? Oh, what's that? The porpoise guy? No, no, he was a navy crypto linguist. Uh, yeah, he broke, broke, he broke codes. He broke codes for the navy. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about the guy that developed the uh, speak with the porpoise and the dolphins. No, oh, he, I, know who you, I know who you're talking about. Uh, don't remember Scott, his name, but it's... Uh, shoot, I can't think of his name now. He's a psychologist. Mm -hmm. by trade. Uh, shucks. I, I tell you what, uh, as I grow older, I find my memory fails me in many, many ways. Uh uh, you know, I guess that's normal. I hope it is, but uh, <laughs> that stuff that well, stuff you, happens, sir. That's the I reason why I write things down. But you just the only problem is you got to remember where you put the notes. That's I, right. It's, it's, it's just that you still have to have a memory. Yeah. Well, I, can, I can say, sir, Mister Davis. Uh, you know, I'm not 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 saying this just to just just to to be nice. I'm saying this because it's amazing. You are you have. A lifetime of a treasure trove of information. Uh, I've watched so many. I've watched your documentaries, uh, your your video footage, and your study of the Patterson Gimlin. It's just amazing. I am so grateful to have you on the show tonight. It's uh, uh, well, I, when I you accepted my friend. Yeah, when you accepted my friend request on Facebook, I I, I felt like I'd. I just met a big major celebrity. I mean, I was telling my wife, you know, that I, that I just made a, made a friend request with MK Davis. She goes, "Who?" I'm like, "Well, you don't do this, so no, you don't research like I do. It's a big deal to me." Well, you know, I've I've gotten to the point where I'm getting close to the maximum they let you have friends, and um, I, I I 
I get a lot of requests that are just spurious. Yeah. You know, uh, and so if you know somebody that, that would like to be my friend, you know, and they've tried and I didn't answer or didn't mm -hmm. just tell them to try to message me or, okay. or, or get a hold of you and let me know. Okay. And, I, and I'll uh, accept their request then. Um, it, it's uh, you, you'll, you'll find that out about me that I, I really appreciate support and, and, and uh, friends. You know, well, if there's anything we can do to help you, just yeah. let us know. I mean, and you are welcome on the show anytime, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on tonight. Well, I know it's, uh, you know, you're on Georgia time, aren't you? I uh, mean, I'm central time. It's oh, 10, you're in central time. Okay. 10, 10, 10. I didn't want to keep you up too late. You know, we tend to go pretty late. So, you know, you're welcome to stay as long as you want to stay, but I don't want to, don't want you to make you stay up past your bedtime. So if you're yeah, not, on the East coast, <laughs> yeah, you're on the East coast, Nick. It's almost 12 that, midnight. <laughs> That that's another thing that happens when you get older. It's Betty by time. Mm. <laughs> Bet <laughs> I spent so many years working the graveyard shift. My body just naturally wants to be up at night now, so I, I tend to forget that other people want to go to bed. As well, my, I, my my grandma I, used to say, "With the chickens." I worked shift work for many 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 years. We rotated, uh, but uh, I, I have left here from where I am here in Mississippi. And in 27 hours would be in Death Valley. That's a so, heck of a drive. Yes, wow. and I, I don't, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I've I've driven right past your neighborhood when we would go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, on vacation. Yeah, well, stop by, stop by. I, I would love to. Well, we'll head over to a Cracker Barrel. I uh, well, I stopped at a Cracker Barrel there in in Memphis, eh, not Memphis, in in uh, Mississippi. No, no, it was in Georgia, and. Uh, we I, here in Missouri, it's hit or miss if a restaurant's got sweet tea, and I love sweet tea. Uh, so I asked the waitress, I'm like, I said, "Ma'am, do y'all have sweet tea?" And she looks at me and she put her hand on my forearm. She goes, "Honey, <laughs> honey, it don't come any other way." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Except that when you get older and you get a little diabetic, you start asking for unsweetened or either half and half. Yeah. Uh, that, that's where it, people don't last forever. That's, yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's the saddest thing. Um, and 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 so more and more as time goes by, uh, uh, as the people that have carried the weight in the Bigfoot community and they begin to fall by the wayside, and, and other people move in, and, and so another generation takes over. Uh, what what? What I do appreciate about uh, the generation that we're in right now is that, like, like I, my my WordPress site, mm -hmm. I can leave some of it as a legacy. Absolutely, you know, and and people can build on it. If and, you don't mind uh, me asking, how old are you? Uh, I'm 65, but I've I've had a few health issues. Uh, I had a heart attack. And then I've got some heart problems ongoing. So you know, uh, you, we're not we're not here forever. That's the thing, you know. So you, you you do what you can do with what you have to do with now, because I, tomorrow's I'm, not guaranteed. That's not a fact. Guaranteed it. Nope. I, I will try to carry the torch as long as I can. I, I, I'm a, just a few weeks away from turning 51. Uh, so I want to keep researching and keep learning everything I can learn and hopefully share that through not just my books, but through my interactions and shows like this. Well, you're in a good spot, actually. It's a good time to be 51. Uh, 51 is, is you've got maturity, but you haven't run out of gas. So, well, you know, I hope it, I never do run out of gas. It, it's a good spot to be in. Uh, you know, when I was 51, that's where I was at. You know, some of my best work was at 51. Look at Roger. He's 39. <laughs> oh, 32? <laughs> okay. <laughs> He'll take it. Except he lost his hair, but. Or uh, you just I, I don't mind. I don't mind 65. Really, I don't. Uh, well, you don't, don't look it, sir. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I I've tried to try to uh, to get I tell you, say keep keep age, old man time, old Chronos from overtaking me. Um, but you know, uh, ultimately, I know where it all ends. So I want to I want to make sure people have uh, a good solid foundation. For some of this stuff right here is hard to come by. You know, it's hard fought for. Yeah. And uh, you 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 want that stuff to be. You don't want other people to have to just compl- go back through those things again. Um, and I, I'll, I'll probably need to write down some of it, some of it as an account. Uh, my meeting with Miss Patterson needs to, definitely needs to be written down. Um, you know, and, and some of my trips to Bluff Creek, uh, the experiences there, which I've never, I've never been disappointed at Bluff Creek. It's always something happens. You know, you uh, know? something you could, you, you uh, might want to consider is um, just doing video video, uh, video blogs. Just sit down and turn your camera on, talk about the incident just like you're telling a story around a campfire, and put it on your website. I think people would love those. That might be a, a, good, uh, a good way of doing it. I, w- I would watch them. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the thing about it is, cause, you know, as you get older, you begin to realize that, that it could get away from you. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you could live your life without ever uh, doing it, uh, what you intended to do. What you, you know? I feel like as a writer uh, that I'm doing what I what I was meant to do. Uh, I spent years in law enforcement until my back gave out. Uh, I've, I've got severe stenosis of the spine and uh, there may be wheels in my, my not so distant future. Um, but my mind is crystal clear and I want to still do what I what I'm passionate about, and that's that's right, and investigate things like this. I just I absolutely have a a thirst for learning about it. Have you ever have you ever had had any kind of uh, vivid dreams? Yes, I have. I have. Uh, my son he has a word for it. I can't remember what he called it, uh, but I, I get very vivid dreams a lot of times. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Hindu word called Nabi. It's N A B H I. It's uh, it 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 in in Nabi, they say that the spine is an antenna, mm-hmm. and that the spine can actually receive information from a larger, more broader source, and that people who have injured their spines oftentimes will have those vivid dreams information come in in prodigious amounts but unevenly Mm -hmm. and they it causes them to have vivid dreams uh, or even uh, innate abilities uh uh, sometimes people will like dive into a pool and and break their neck Mm -hmm. and they wake up from their coma and they can play music and they never played music before, you know. For uh, it, that's that's the whole concept of the Nabi is that the spine can receive information. That uh, that actually kind of explains what happened to me. Uh, before well, I wrote the Ragnarok Rising Saga, which was a zombie series with with a Norse twist, uh, I wrote that. I started back in 2012, and I finished it in roughly 2016. It was a ten, now a ten book series. Uh, I wrote that, and those were spaced out. I wrote them just when I when I could sit down and write. But after my injury, I can sit down and do ten thousand words at a setting. I can I can do a seventy five thousand word book in a month. Well, that that may be it may be may be explainable by that. You can look it up, Google it, and see what you think. N N A B H I. Yeah, I've got it pulled up. I'm going to read about it after the show. Yeah, I'll add, uh, add yeah. that to my reading list. A lot of times. A lot of times we we tend to dismiss those things as just uh, mystical or esoterical, but they're sometimes they're based in 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 actual occurrences, in yeah. facts. Uh, and so you know, I, I've I've tried to pay attention 
ever since I first learned about it, uh, that when someone has hurt their spine, I usually will ask them, and, you know, have you had any of this, experienced any of this? Uh, and oftentimes they tell me, like you did, that they have. Yeah, my son they, refers uh, to it as lucid dreaming. I just just remembered the term. But, yeah, I, I get I, – I, it's fairly regular for me. In fact, for a while I was keeping a dream journal. I'd wake up and it would still be clear in my mind. I'd make notes about it. But I do. I get vivid dreams all the time, half for the last year or so. Yeah, well, you don't want to get hurt just to have vivid dreams. No, no, no definitely not. <laughs> if, if somebody has – has injured their spine through other means and then they suddenly have some in, something improved about their about their uh you know mental abilities or 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 or, or talents mm -hmm. you know I, I always want to know if i can you know i think that's real fascinating uh nick i think sergio's got a question for you he says what's your favorite myth myth oh <laughs> my favorite myth would be the thunderbirds <laughs> Oh, those are good. Those are some interesting. Texas, you know, and all the different Indian tribes, and uh, the uh, the funny thing about the Thunderbirds is we, uh, being white men, uh, kind of fear it, but the Indians look upon it as uh, you know a protector from the gods, mm -hmm. uh, and like you know they're just you know they don't fear it at all. They look at it as a good omen, and uh, the Thunderbird myth just goes really super deep really go super deep and that's definitely my, my favorite myth I, I went into a cave in Idaho and way back in a crawl space there was this giant bird skeleton uh, and I take it to be an ostrich what I don't in, know in Idaho? I, yeah it's an Idaho oh, uh, wow. there, there were no feathers associated with it but it's bones like the leg bones would be this this big around you know it'd be huge that's a big bird uh it it, it was it I, sh I regret not pulling it out of there uh, i can't see an ostrich waddling its way back up in that <laughs> tight crawl space like that you know that's uh, really really bizarre to find back there well i, th I figured maybe it was uh Maybe it was uh, just a uh, somebody's ostrich that got loose or something like that. That's kind of my thoughts. But uh, something dragged it back there and ate it. Well, it, it left no feathers. There were no feathers, and I, I know in a cave environment, feathers will last a long time. That is kind uh, of bizarre. Yeah, there were no feathers and no meat on the bones. Sergio says, have you ever tried setting up a rig that would mimic that wood sound out in the field to see if you could get a response? Yeah, if you recorded the wood on wood tone with a synthesizer, you could adjust the tone and pitch and duration. You could make all kinds of different sounds with it. I that's wonder if that would work. I'm sure that's uh, somebody, so it, it'd be a good project to do. Yeah, it would be interesting. I would, might, wouldn't mind trying that. I don't really do the calls. I see that on TV and people doing out there making Bigfoot calls. As I, I have the, the the sneaking suspicion that you don't know what you're saying. Uh, you you might be making a challenge. You might have called his mother ugly. You might have even asked him out on a date. And I don't particularly have a plan for a for an amorous Bigfoot coming charging out of the woods. Uh, I can I can tell you some stories about playing back Bigfoot recordings. Really. Yeah, that caused a whole bunch of stuff to happen. Uh, but I, it's just too much to get into tonight, but maybe for another time. Oh, you are welcome back anytime. We'd love to have you back. It, it definitely got responses. <laughs> yeah. When I was up in Washington State uh, with a little group that we were trying to find Sasquatch uh, footprints or hair or anything like that, there was another group that we came upon they had taken the head off of an axe handle and they were just using the wood itself and they were banging on the trees over there and they actually got a response a double response for their double response and they kept doing it and they were laughing they thought it was funny i don't think they were researchers they were just goofing around uh, it started to get closer and closer and closer we took off after that but, I mean, we're talking about, you can hear it possibly, Judge, say, maybe a half a mile away. 
and then at one point it seemed more like just a football field away. Now that's a little uh, a little scary at that point. You know why is it coming closer and closer? I, I, I in, in the in the mountain above the Patterson film site. You know it's a very steep slope, and about maybe a thousand yards, a thousand feet up, there was right. a there was a game trail that went along, you know, horizontally along the side of the hill. The ridge line? Yeah. In, in that game trail was a stick that was put into the earth. I don't know whether it, a hole was dug for it or whether it was jammed, but it was a, a, a no bark on it. It was, uh, uh, I, for all intents and purposes a, a tree knock stick you know and I, and now you guys got me wondering if they don't make them with different tunes for different places so this is a possibility now definitely a different possibility and what you were saying about the different tunes and everything how they might possibly communicate and you know identify each other and a different hardwood will make a different tone yeah, exactly. Right, right. Now, you recall how thick around that, that piece of wood was? Uh, maybe about two inches. Mm. And it's uh, all the bark, huh? Yeah, it Definitely. may have been. It, you know, it was probably bigger than two, maybe two and a half to three. Still a uh, good sized piece of wood. A good sized piece of wood, and it was dense. You know, it, it would ring if you hit something with it. Yeah. Kind of like a ball bat. Yeah. Because I remember when that thing hit the tree, it, it had a resonation to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I saw the figure of it, you know, through the through the brush. Uh, and it, it was right there, on, right there, real close to the Patterson film site. Well, that, well, that we, whole area has a rich history of sightings. I found a rock stack at the same day, a rock stack down in the bed of the creek. There was three rocks, one on top of the other, and the top one had a wet print with sand on top of it. So I know how fresh it was. Mm -hmm. so we, a lot of, lot of really fresh sign down there. Like I said, it never fails to disappoint. It's, a, it's still a, a really hot place to go. I have a, I guess, a little question here for you that comes up and on questioning when I'm on different podcasts. They would ask me, and I, I tell I tell people not to do this, but a gift giving. Uh, we we recently had a lady that would, was putting out apples on a um, a stump, a tree stump that had been cut down years ago on her own property. Yeah, on her own property, and the apples were were taken. Uh, sometimes she would find a rock in their place. Uh, she'd find a leaf. Uh, unfortunately for her, uh, Mr. Davis, she, she had to go care for her parents and she wasn't able to leave the apples every day like she was doing. Uh, and something had started to happen around her household. The outside area that she had a fenced in, wooden fenced in area where she put her garbage cans and over the top was um a fence like a metal fence grating right over the top you know to keep raccoons out yeah and uh because she was away for like four or five days uh this whole thing was torn apart i mean there was nothing in the garbage cans but it was torn apart uh you give any credence to that you know like people yes i do yes I do. i've seen examples of it ah thank you yeah. yes yes uh, you don't you know, it's it's a lot of good reasoning. You don't want them on your property, no. <laughs> uh, because it's it's not because of what you do. It's because of what they do. Uh, they're 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 obsessive compulsive. Uh, you know, uh, if you get them started, you can't yeah. get the you can't get them stopped. Yeah, they expect something. It looks they, like I mean, right. It has to it with expectations and and pr provocative behavior. 
<laughs> yes, sir. I'm glad you said that because she had been doing that for over six months and she uh, reported to my group that she was having a dog man problem and she was so uptight that she wouldn't even leave her house to go to work. We had to go there and we, we finally got there a little after one in the morning and I'll tell you, our experience wasn't uh, a fun experience and she told us later on that she had what she had been doing with the apples and she had to stop and that was a I wish she would have told us because it was a dangerous situation. It, it it can be bad, and if if even if even if nobody gets hurt out of it, yeah, uh, you, you you end up being consumed by by their behavior. You know, you can't have a normal life when you go out in your yard. Mm -hmm. You having to check your yard out to see what's been done. You know, like yeah. To get to, to once they get attention, they crave it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm I'd glad you said that. That's information I really needed. Yeah. I've been in, in contact with a with a Bigfoot group in northern Arkansas, and here's a couple of the images they sent me that they found. Uh, oh, they yeah. said that they left some apples on a tree stump. This is out in the middle of the woods, not near their house, and they came back later and found mice wrapped in leaves. Wow. Well, that's a it's a cinch that it who that's a that's a cairn. I got to mm. give you a um I got to give you some information that I have on that. Um there's a a gentleman whose name escapes me right now, but he does that. He does that for artwork in in the in the forest area who puts up rocks and it does I mean he knows how to put them in a certain way and the formations are like art. So I'm just wondering if that's something that he may have done. In, well, I'm, well I'm if he's sure been in northern Arkansas. <laughs> people will do it. I mean, people certainly can do it, and they will do it. Uh, out in Death Valley, you see quite a few cairns, you know, people stack rocks and stuff. Yeah. But um, uh, that it, it, it's also known that Bigfoot does it, too. This was a petroglyph they found on a bluff side. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> wow. Look. Uh, that is that is something. Hmm. How about that? How That's large? Ar is that in Arkansas? That's in Arkansas. How large an area think that covered? Uh, they didn't put anything in for reference, and I didn't ask. Uh, but if you well get the uh, banner out of there real quick, if I, had uh, guess, I would say yes. Take that banner out of there real fast. I got to find it. Four, four acres, maybe no. There we go. Thanks, Roger. Um, it's it's in the deep woods that, where they where they wow. go out and research. Uh, but if you look at the size of the feet on the on the drawing and the size yeah. of the guy with the bow next to him, <laughs> and, and look here, I, that, that's the tight feet I said belong to a, the splayed like toes. Yeah, the splayed toes with the uh, they they're saucy. I call them sausage toes. Uh -huh. They're long long toes. Uh, that that's that would be like a true Bigfoot, you know. Uh, well, it's, the, it's massive compared to the others. Yeah. Wow. That is that's king something. of the forest. Mm. I can send you that image if you like, Mr. Davis. Yeah, please do. I have to say, gentlemen, I've done a lot of research over my a couple of decades worth of cryptozoology stuff, but. I've learned a ton of stuff from you, Mr. Davis, and you've also sparked some other ideas, you know, that came forward through this conversation. Uh, a lot of information, and, and that well, Ghibli film showing the the eye shine—I mean, that's nothing I thought about before. That 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 is totally amazing. Yeah, it it, it definitely has eye shine in the Patterson film. So, uh, uh, I mean. I, I, you you know you're not looking at a, at a at a regular person you know right. just that alone yeah um, that's some some guy dressed a big guy dressed up in a uniform uh, that's that's pretty convincing uh, to have the eye shine which we can't can't duplicate you know well, uh, Roger did you say uh, you had some pictures that you'd found you're my you're muted Rog we can't hear you you're muted. Yeah, this is when you guys were talking about the location or when Mr. Davis said what it was like 
right by the shooting site, and this is an aerial view, I would imagine just north of, as Mr. Davis was talking about that. Is is that correct, Mr. Davis? Is that what it looks like, that area? Hold on here. I, uh, I've lost you here. I've lost the image. Uh, let's see here. I don't know how to get back to it. I think I see it. Hold on. Nope. You're in the background now. <laughs> All right. Let me go up top. Looks I think like your, the your image, image is frozen. frozen up. You're not showing up in here. On this image, it gives the GPS location, more or less. There's actually a trail that you can follow up there. There's quite a bit if you do a search on Google. Uh, there is a trail, which is uh, kind of cool, I suppose. Roger, can you give me two minutes? I've got to run across the hall to the restroom. We got you covered. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Roger, that was Arkansas that you were showing? Uh, no, that was the uh, site of the Patterson-Gimlin film. Oh, oh, that was the site. Okay. He, well, at least it's what Mr. Davis had mentioned, that north of that area, it's it, there's a high incline. Did we lose Mr. Davis? Oh, there it is. All right. I had to go back through the whole nine yards to get you back. That phone must be overheating. <laughs> <laughs> It's an old phone. The image that I have is something I found. Is that what it looks like just north of the filming site of Patterson Gimlin? Uh, the one you're looking at? Yes. Mm, I, I can't really tell. You know, it's real rugged country, but I, I really can't tell looking at that where it's at. Fair enough. Uh, there were images on Google which give an idea of how rugged it is and when you mentioned that just north of it there's a slope i went looking and i found those images right there yeah it's it's really it's really rugged and uh, uh up above up behind the site behind the film site it's 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 pretty much about 45 degree angle straight up and you go up about 1500 feet and you run into culverts uh and these are the culverts i assume that were mentioned in some of the the experiences where the logging the bigfoot through the culverts down the mountainside when they were constructing those roads these are these are on the side of the mountain and they're wrapped around trees and stuff um and then you go up above that, and then there's an old logging road. And then above that, you run into a, a, a stream and waterfalls and all kinds of stuff up that way. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's just really, really rugged country. Um, I've got a friend that lives up in Humboldt. And uh, he's, he said probably in July he's going to be taking uh, uh, several friends and making an expedition up in that area, and he's going to try to live stream it for me if he can get a signal. There ain't much signal there. I, I've gotten a signal on the ridge tops, mm -hmm. uh, but down in the creek bed is not much of anything. Yeah, he said if nothing else, he's just going to shoot a bunch of videos and send them to me of that, of that area. So hopefully Definitely sometime in bad. July – We'll have some live, well, recent footage from the area. Yeah, well, uh, when I go back, I'll I'll take some more myself. Uh, I'll be glad to share them with you. That would be awesome. Uh, I took some uh, video one time. It's 2008. And we had been up there to that same area where those culverts were. And 
I had Don Monroe with me and a friend of his, the, the gentleman we call Bear, and their their feet were hurting, and so I left them and I came on down the mountain ahead of them, and I crossed, got down in the creek and across the creek, and I came down a trail on the other side, and came back out in the creek, and I was going to film them when they when they came down, and you know just for for filming you know and seven years later i was looking at that video and there was a bigfoot in it nah. I, I i saw a white thing move and and i back it up and i did a frame by frame and it was a bigfoot sitting in the shadows with some kind of white cloth uh and and i assume he must have it must have been something the firefighters left there. And and it was you know, it was the worst, most anticlimactic thing I ever watched in my life. Cause I'd had this thing for seven years. <laughs> Never knew it was there. Never knew it was there. And uh and I watched the video and I heard a rock, two rocks clack together. And you could hear that over the sound of the water, you know, in the creek. Yeah. And when the, when the rocks clacked, this thing backed up into the brush and just became invisible. And uh, I, I walked right, right in front of it, you know, waiting on Don. I walked down. And then I walked back beside it. It never moved, never budged. <laughs> That's a, that was what I what I was told when I was a little kid learning to deer hunt is that be still. You know, be quiet and be still. And you know, movement is what gives you away. And you know, he said it doesn't matter if you're wearing hunter's orange, if you are still and making no noise, you know, the deer will still come will still come. And that was the hardest thing for me to learn as a fidgety little idiot kid was how to sit still, control my breathing, and not move. It, I felt like the worst Bigfoot researcher in the whole, the whole world. But the you know, important thing is, is you did find it. Well, I guess so. But, you know, it was carrying. It had two sticks with it. And I, I got to looking at the sticks. I took some pretty good video and stills but it was always in the edge because i i was aiming down the creek mm -hmm. uh and it looked to me like it was wrapped with cord the, the sticks like a like a salmon a salmon harpoon mm -hmm. you yeah. know they wrap they wrap it in cord and they stick the salmon and they pull the whole thing up with a cord right uh, and that's what it looked in it. There, there's no salmon in Bluff Creek, mm -hmm. so it had to have come up from the Klamath River, uh, which is Bluff Creek runs into the Klamath River, and they have yeah. big salmon runs down there. Right, that you know, if, if that's the prize time for bear to you know put on their winter weight, and, and same thing logic would go for Bigfoot, that would be just a bonanza of food. Yeah, well, it's a. Uh, uh, you can probably find that in some of my. I probably have some stuff on the Davis report about it. Uh, I don't. You know, you'd have to look for it, but I call it the Croucher. Because uh, it was crouching down by the creek, but it it was it was slick as a whistle. It just backed into the brush. And apparently there was another one there because I heard a rock clack on the video. I didn't, I didn't pay any attention to it live. Uh, this was 2008. And there was so much sign. I mean, we found tracks. I mean, it, they were just in there, you know. Um, well, Mr. Davis, you shouldn't feel too bad because it's not the first time that I've heard that 
a Sasquatch or maybe a dogman has photobombed somebody's pictures, you know, that they've taken of an area and then they go back and look at it and they're like, hey, what's that over there? I mean, uh, just recently, a friend of mine, Greg Yost, he's a Sasquatch guy and uh, he was taking a picture of a forest area and he didn't notice it for weeks and somebody said, hey, look, there's a dogman right there and he was just taking a picture of the forest area because it was such a lovely area mr uh, davis do you mind uh, telling us a little bit about this footage oh yeah what's that uh that's that's some footage that came out of georgia uh you know who uh kids took that footage really yeah they took it out of the window of their house wow That one's pretty grainy. I'd like to see you do your magic on that one. That would be pretty good. Well, uh, you know, it, they, they, that they, they're none of them as good as the Patterson film so far, but that, 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 I believe that probably was something. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about that, about that incident down, down in Bluff Creek now. Uh, I have lots of regrets about that, you know? I was hoping I could find it. I've been scrolling down through your, your page. Bigfoot in Death Valley. This one's from East Texas. Well, you've collected a lot of video. You, you can find uh, you can find some of it uh, on YouTube. Probably just type in M.K. Davis, the Croucher. I will try that right now. Yeah, you might find it there. I hope you can. You see what I'm talking about. That's bothered me ever since. I kind of regret even, even looking at, you know, finding it now, you know. Because you know, I, th I think about it all the time. You know how close, how close I was. Let's see if I can find a different view. The Bluff Creek Croucher video, what is in the cloth? Okay, that I found that one pretty quick. That should show you something. Hello, I'm MK Davis. Uh, just at a time, I mean, nine day, and, and when it, and I thought, Well, that's not really showing it actually running the film. It's just a still. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. What do you think? What do you, what do you think it is? Uh, Doug's at your uh, uh, free knock or sounds like it you know, rocks together. It sort of sounds, let's listen. Oh. It's called uh, the Bluff Creek Croucher video. Some what is in the cloth? Stuff from down on Bluff Creek. The back. I, I don't got upset about it. You can see him down at the bottom down there with that cl white cloth or whatever yep. it is.
if you let it run, it'll 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 actually play the video. Okay. That's that's a still image. It's got something that's wrapping up in that cloth. I don't know what it is. Uh, you can see a little shape there. Yeah. Yeah, you see the movement. It's probably using that cloth for the uh, like the what would you call that that homemade satchel? Uh, I don't remember what you called it. A parfletch, yeah. A parfletch. It might have been using it for that. It might have it. It could have had a fish. It could have had a little sasquatch. It could have had anything, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there I am standing there. I don't even see it. I'm looking in my little my little viewfinder, you know. Well, don't feel too bad because something very similar happened to me um, about 18 months ago. Uh, my friend Steve, my partner in crime, he's my best friend. We went down to a spot here in Missouri called the Joe Bald Recreation Area. It's an, it, it's, it's a, it used to be an Army Corps of Engineers campground that they shut off. Uh, they shut it down, won't let anybody camp there about 20 years ago, twenty maybe a little over 20 years ago. Um, they won't allow anybody in there after dark. Uh, well, I wanted to set a book there. So Steve and I decided we were going to go down there one night and we snuck in when it was dark and uh, we shot a video and it was just a couple minutes long. It was just me talking about the Joe Bald area and how I wanted to, you know, was research, researching areas for future books. And it was researching an area for the book I call Lakeview Man. And when, when we recorded the video, we didn't see anything, didn't see anything. We didn't hear anything. Uh, we got in, got in the van and we went into Branson and had dinner. I mean, his wife, me, me, my wife, him and his wife, all four of us were down there in our van and none of us saw or heard anything, didn't feel anything out of place. And we went on our merry way. Well, uh, I go to upload the video to YouTube for my YouTube channel and I start seeing, I start seeing eye shine in the background and I'm, um, I was like, oh, well, I didn't, didn't notice that. I thought, well, yeah, it was probably just an owl or something like that. <laughs> um, that it, it wasn't anything anything worth really paying attention to. Uh, flash forward to, what, four or five months ago, Roger? Uh, we brought the video up on an episode of The Nightmare Hunter. We just were going to talk about it, talk about the Joe Bald area, because it was featured in one of my books. And one of the viewers, who's also a friend of Roger's, his name, his name is uh, Thomas Whitney, he said, hang on, I saw a movement. And I was like, oh, no, there's nothing there. And he goes, no, I'm telling you, behind one of the trees, I saw a movement. Uh, so uh, a couple friends of mine that do, do video editing uh, isolated that area, and they slowed it down. And I'll, I'll play the slowed down uh, portion of the video, and you'll probably see the move. Well, the movement's almost dead center in the frame in a tree about 30 yards, maybe maybe 25 yards from where we were where we were shooting the video. And it was it was nothing. It was no video. We didn't go down there looking for Bigfoot. We just went down there to shoot a goofy video for my YouTube channel to promote my books. Uh, well, the guys started isolating images from that. And the first thing that I saw uh, was just, you know, just looked like a, a shape. Uh, kind of poking out from behind one of the trees. Um, and they tried to clear it up a little bit. And I'm like, okay, kid, just probably pareidolia or a, a bush or something. Uh, then they brought it out a little bit more. And then they brought that out. And I was like, holy crap. Uh, we went back to the spot. There's nothing there that that could have been. It was something sticking out behind the tree about eight feet off the ground. <laughs> yeah. And there you can see a hand as well. Man. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> Are you going to tell the rest of the story? Because, Mr. Davis, I get a lot of mileage out of this other part he, of the story. He loves the bit. Before we started shooting the video, um, 
we were just we pulled in and we were talking. We were looking around. We hadn't shot the video yet. Uh, the whole video in its entirety is on my Ozark Haunted Pathways trail. It's just called the Joe Bald Recreation Area, and it's just me talking about the area. But before we shot the video, Steve says, I've got to take a leak. So he walked almost over to that spot to pee before he came back over to film the video. And then we filmed the video, and that's in it. And Mr. Davis, I say that his friend is marking territory, and that's what you know cryptids and animals usually do. And he probably ticked them off quite a bit. Uh, Steve's pee may have brought it in. <laughs> Maybe so. Uh, if you look on my uh, my my uh, channel there, mm -hmm. under M.K. Davis discusses frame 362 of the Patterson film, that's the one with the eye glow, the filtered image. Okay. Um, on your YouTube channel? Oh, M.K. Davis. Yeah, uh, on my YouTube channel. What's the YouTube you, channel? Is that Green Wave 2010? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or you can you can probably just type it in under that. Okay. Um, and just discuss his frame 362. That will have you. You will see the eye shine. Let's see where it is. That's a big cotton mouth. <laughs> Five at 515. Well, if, around 5.15. Oh, yeah. I'm looking for the, the one that says discusses that particular frame. <laughs> it's, it's pretty. It's a lot of, lot of videos on here. How far down is it on the page? Do you know? Oh, no, I just typed in uh, M.K. Davis discusses frame 362. That's all you got to type in. It'll go to it. 362? Yeah. I see somebody else has uploaded a video to my channel. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> okay, let me share the screen. I've got that video up. Yeah, go to, uh, I think it's... 421. Go to 421. I venture. I, I zoom in on it. Look at those eyes. Look at those eyes. If you look, you see that eye, it's glowing. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. You know. That's not something a human can fake. No, no, uh-uh. Yeah, as much analysis as you've done, as you've done of this, and just just the stuff you showed us tonight, I was already convinced. But I can't see how somebody could still be skeptical after looking at all the things you found. Well, you just got you have to be a flaming skeptic. Yeah, don't believe anything or any anyone. Uploaded one month ago, M.K. Davis discusses the Patterson film frame 352. That's not my work. Uh, it's, a, it's the Bigfoot Project. I don't even know who that is. How did it get put on your channel? <laughs> well, maybe it's not on my channel. Maybe it just came up in the list after I typed in M.K. Davis discusses. It may, it may have. Anyway, uh, I didn't put it up there. Oh, somebody's got a lot of my stuff up there. I, I don't care. It's a. Uh... I'm I'm pretty generous with my stuff. I don't I don't like people to use it, you know, in some negative fashion, but. Um, do you uh, do you mind if we use your footage from time to time from your YouTube no, channel? No, I don't mind a bit. Okay. Well, I may be uh, pulling some of that up from time to time then. Yeah, because you, you've got such great footage. That's a, it's it all it all started with a, a huge effort to find the best images. Uh, you know, uh, I told y'all when I saw I saw a couple of frames that were really good and. I, I traveled to Oregon and made all those contacts, and mm -hmm. uh, I got I got frames from 
uh, people who had you know close connections with the original. Mm -hmm. um, so having quality stuff to work with has a lot to do with that. And, and well, it certainly uh, shows. Yeah, these, these yeah. are some of the best the best views of the of the Patterson Gimlin film that I've ever seen. The ones I've always seen were ones that have been shown on TV and were really really grainy. Uh, these are much clearer. Yeah, they're good. It's good stuff. And I'm uh, it it uh, it really uh, you know I I want it to to be serve as a it's kind of something that someone could l launch another person into this you know yeah, absolutely uh, i can see how it would easily yeah the more the more the more people you got working on the problem the more likely to get it solved well i tell you what i'm fixing to have to turn in <laughs> well, I know it's getting pretty getting pretty late. Uh, yeah, I'm going. I'm going to have nightmares about that darn thing. <laughs> In the down there with that white claw, <laughs> son of a gun, you slipped by me. <laughs> Slip by me. Well, we all missed stuff. I certainly did. I don't know what I'd have done if I had seen it. I, I, I don't know. Uh, well, maybe it's best you didn't because you were pretty close. Yeah, I was real close. I got within about 15 feet of it. Yeah, if you had seen it and brought attention to the fact that you knew it was there, it might have turned violent. Maybe so. Maybe so. so. Maybe I it's might, for the best you didn't see it. I might be a part of Bluff Creek right now. <laughs> or one of the missing 411 cases. Yeah, that's right, Ben and David. You don't want to end up in one of his books. No, definitely not. I would love to meet David, but I, I'm a big fan of his work. Oh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of yours. He's he's a he's a heck of a nice fella. He he's a, a ex policeman, mm -hmm. you know, and he he attacks every problem in a in a in a very uh, pol prescribed way, like the police do, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, you know, if I if I had done something wrong and had David Pilates after me, <laughs> I would go I would go ahead and turn myself in. <laughs> He's the Sherlock Holmes of our day. Yeah. Some of the stuff he's found is just astounding. Yeah. He's and to look at the, the, the hot spots on the map that he's got, like, hey, some of those aren't too far from here. No, he had, actually, he's got, uh, he, he's broadened out and he covers a good part of the world even. Uh, and then, you know, you know, you don't want to be the one to represent your state. No, 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 no. I'll pass on that. <laughs> Although right, I said it, it does seem to have a tendency to abduct the ones that are either uh, very young or old and, and, and injured. So it might be me that he goes after. <laughs> well, maybe so. Uh, I was going to say something else. I can't think of what it is. I ain't got too tired to even think. Well, we appreciate you coming on, and oh, I'm so, really sorry well. we kept you up past your bedtime, but I really, no, that's really right. grateful to have you on the show. I'm, I'm good. Thank you, sir. Definitely. I'm good. And I, I'd like, I, I'll be, I'd love to come back on again if you. Oh, you are welcome anytime. I would love okay. to have you back on. I'd like to hear about uh, what you were gonna gonna tell us about the people getting responses from calls. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, it 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 it. it there are certain calls mm -hmm. that that actually absolutely mean something to them. Uh, well, they, there's the one they, that sounds kind of like a siren that I'm pretty sure is a territorial challenge. Maybe so. I don't know, but I wouldn't play this other one I'm talking about again. Do you? Uh, do you have a copy of it? I do. <laughs> I I would love to have those sounds. I'm not going to go out and play them in the woods. I'm not an idiot, but I would like like to hear them. Well, you, I'd like to go out there with a full team and, uh, well, two teams and <clears throat> play those sounds. <laughs> See don't, what happen. don't play them near your house is all I can say. <laughs> oh, no, 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 definitely not. Well, play if, if you, uh, my neighbor's house, who I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. 
if uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to have a copy of those, and you are welcome back. Uh, I will get in touch with you probably in a week or so, and we'll see about getting you on the show again, and we can talk about uh, those calls and and uh, look at more footage and and uh, just astound everybody. I mean, I've I thought I knew the Patterson Gimlin footage pretty well until yeah. I started looking at what you've done. And the stuff you've talked about tonight is just incredible. And uh, I am I am so grateful you came on the show, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate thank it. You, sir. And, uh, we'll we'll see you next time and and I'll I'll get you a copy of that uh, audio. I would love to hear it. Thank you, sir. Right. You have a great night. Good night take care. Freeze frame. There we go. DA, I'm going to tell you, man, I've studied a lot about that over the decades, and I learned at least, uh, let me see, I'm taking notes, at least six, seven different things. Wow. Yeah, I, I knew when it comes to the Patterson-Gimlin footage, MK is probably the authority I would go to. If he says if he says it's in there, it's in there. You know, I never really thought about looking at the eye shine in that film, and that eye shine is definitely there. There's no faking that. Well, if I mean, you go, if you go to his website that we that he was telling us about uh, yeah. the the Davis report, um, if you go to his website on that, or you go to his his uh, YouTube channel, there, are, I mean, you could watch videos for days. There's right. just tons of videos, and it, not all of it's Bigfoot. Some of it's some of it's other cryptids. Some of it's like the thylacine. But he has got an amazing array of wow. videos. He's an, he's analyzed. Oh God, that thylacine or something. What was that from 1936 or something? I think it was somewhere, someone back in the back in around then. I remember uh, something about that. Yeah, they thought they they thought they were extinct for I think somewhere close to 100 years. But yeah. uh, there's a lot of people looking for them, and there are reports all the time of people seeing them. And mind you, in 1936, they couldn't do uh, CGI or anything like that. Right. Oh, my God. Look at the mouth on that thing and that thin snake-like tongue. And, woo, that, that's amazing. I wonder, I got to look that back up and see where that was. Hmm. I think that was in Thailand or something or? What, the thylacine? No, it was. Yeah. I thought it was in Tasmania. Aust yeah, either Australia or Tasmania. Australia or Tasmania? Yeah, I thought it Probably was in Tasmania. Tasmania. Uh, that, that's an amazing looking animal. Wow. Roger Peacock says that film is the best evidence I've ever seen, and MK's work cleaning it up was amazing. Yeah, he's done some fantastic work, and I tell you, I'm, I'm just astounded that he came on the show. I mean, he, he's kind of a, That's kind a good of a, catch. yeah, he's kind yeah. of a big deal to me. I mean, I, he's, I've been looking at his work for years. I mean that 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 you know people are saying oh it's a costume, but you know what did they do? Put a put a put a little. A flashlight in there for the eye shine. I doubt if they would have thought about that. Or the the, the, the details that. of like, you know, uh, bre uh, breast for the, uh, the breast it's in breastfeeding. It was actually different times going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the braid and the, the little strap for what? Yeah, I, I had stuff I'd never even knew. Uh, I'm, <laughs> my mind is officially blown. I mean that, that parfletch thing that they carry mm -hmm. stuff in. That's that's showing that's showing higher intelligence to be able to do something like that, and uh, and like I said at the beginning of this, you know, I believe my theory. I believe the reason why we don't see them that much is mm -hmm. because they usually are not out during the daytime, and they're out at nighttime. Which yeah. the forest is their area, not ours, especially with the heightened senses that they have. Uh, I mean, just the eye shine alone shows you they've got heightened vision, you know, over what we have. I may have to uh, see if we can book him again for June. Uh, amazing. Uh, you got to let me know. I got to be on. Oh, I'll definitely. Have more, I'll have some more questions for him. I, I, I mean, I was quite familiar with it, but I learned a bunch, and I hope I was able to donate something to this because it was. Oh, definitely. That was a that was just some amazing footage. Yeah, a lot of good questions for him. That was awesome. Ah, I loved it. That was that was great. Roger, so, you, you haven't said much tonight. Well, I want to thank everyone that's given his likes tonight. I have quite an intensive list. Uh, quite a <laughs> few already, people, actually. Thomas Whitney, Robert Miller, Roger Peacock, Adam Shepard, Joshua Dalton, Jacob Hayes, Tony Kanopka, Richard Sullivan, someone by the name of D.A. Roberts. All somebody Tower on Media. my page. 
I'm sure it was. It Josh wasn't me. Jones. I was astounded to see the comment from my hey, face. I'm like, glad. Hey, did you see the look on my face when you posted up? Like, wait a minute. How did that get up there? I kept yeah. drinking to them all night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Josh Jones, Carrie Gregory, Derek Lacombe, Sergio Lomelli, Cindy Jean Pierre, Luis Noriega, and Todd Hunter. And ungodly amounts of comments. Incredible questions yeah. from everyone in the, in the, the chat room. Uh, I wonder if that wasn't the general, because he's an admin on my my author page. He might have been viewing from my author page. It's possible, Mister Goldman the, also did give us a like. So the, the syntax kind of looks like jo Josh. Uh, it could have been because he did a whole bunch of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Roberts Tower Media and Josh Jones are all in sequence. Not that Who's I'm that paying the attention. The gentleman that you were talking about, Da uh, Pil Pilates. David Polites. He does a, a series called Missing 411. And, oh, uh, and it's called the Can Am Project. Um, he's a former, I think he was a San Francisco detective uh, who started looking into the miss the disappearances in national parks. And his work is amazing. And my, my favorite of his, he, these, a lot of these videos, he's, he makes a lot of videos. You can see him on Amazon Prime. Uh, Missing, Missing 411, The Hunters. So yeah. that, one, that one really creeps me up because yeah, these yeah. are experienced outdoorsmen who were armed that went missing completely, never found. Now that I think back, I've I've seen some of his YouTube stuff on missing hunters, and I just I just can't understand how they they could be missing. Absolutely can't. I mean, especially from the background of some of these people, mm -hmm. it's amazing. So you'd want to get him on the show? I can try to take a shot at that. If we could get David Polites on the show, I mean, that would be awesome. Yeah. All right. I'll see what I can do. That would be outstanding. That'd be fantastic. I mean, this yeah. is the last time I listened to him on a show. He does do shows, uh, but the last one I listened to him was uh, Coast to Coast with George Nori. He was on there. Uh, I mean, tonight's show was fantastic. Uh, that was that, that. That's a grab. That's a find. Unbelievable. Well, uh, next week we've got. Uh, Ron Moorhead, who recorded the Sierra sounds. Oh, that should be interesting, too, then. Mm. Uh, he'll be on Tuesday night next week because Roger's busy on Monday. Uh, so the Monday, uh, the Nightmare Hunter will be on Tuesday next week. Uh, Robert Miller says, don't you think they had ape-like intelligence and then can mimic humans as, as well, especially how folks are carrying satchels, packs, persons? Well, I looked up that uh, parfletch, and apparently Native Americans have been making those for... Time immemorial. Yeah. I mean, since you know, way back in the day. So it's could have been something they picked up from the Native Americans, or that it's a primitive skill. I mean, it's it's yeah, not it's not, a, it's, yeah, it's it's not a complicated thing. It looks like you know, really all you would need is a you know basically a braided piece of string and and a piece of cloth, and you could make one. I mean, I think it's beyond ape-like intelligence. I mean, I, it's just a couple I, of steps of beyond. You know, I, I waffled back and forth throughout my my time investigating Bigfoot. I waffled back and forth between it being just an upright ape or right. it being a relic hominid. And after having MK on and, and him talking about stuff, I'm I'm definitely leaning strongly toward the relic hominid because right. some right. of the some of the tool use, the intelligence, and I, yeah, I'm not gonna rule out mind speak. Um, I personally though think that what are they referred to as the cloaking ability, I think that's more just natural camouflage. Um, you know, a person that knows what they're doing with camouflage can disappear before your eyes. And that doesn't take any magic or, or special abilities. Uh, Todd Hunter says, plus he has three books on Bigfoot. Yeah, David Pilates researched Bigfoot hot and heavy. And in his Missing 411 books, he never comes out and says Bigfoot or Dog Man. But you kind of get that that's what he's leaning at. Yeah. Right. Robert said, Melissa's and mimic that. Uh, yeah, they, they I could easily see them observing people and mimicking what we do. There's Robert's probably a Sasquatch. in Texas right now, right? Yeah, he's in the big thicket area of Texas. Well, I can actually envision a Sasquatch walking around with a piece of bark made to a square and walking around like he's playing on his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Robert will be able to join us next time that would and be awesome. tell us what happened. Well, Texas. he sent me a bunch of pictures and some videos that uh, if he wants to come on the show and tell about what he – what he heard down there because he heard a vocalization and he was paced in the woods and I said he kind of got the feeling he wasn't supposed to be there but 
you know, he was going to be there regardless because he doesn't, he doesn't really pack down from much. But he sent me some really good pictures and a bunch of videos. So, Robert, if you're still listening, I uh, want to get you on the show when you can and talk about, talk about that because I, I, think, I think you had a legitimate encounter, dude. Roger Peacock says, some tribes claim they learned from Sasquatch, which is possible. And then Louise says, if it was a movie back in the early 80s called The Emerald Forest, and they talked about the invisible people, that was a tribe of Indians in Amazon, and says they knew how to camouflage. Yeah, um, if, you, if you live in an environment and you don't want to be found, you are going to develop natural camouflage. I mean, you know, it's, and a lot of it, like I said, is just learning how to not move, how to stand stock still in the right places. Movement. Every time I've ever gotten a deer, it was the movement that gave it away. Robert says, I can't remember which tribe, but they were, said they were a people, not apes. Several tribes said that they were just another tribe of, cre of creatures. And quite a few tribes will say, hey, they live on these mountains. Don't go up there. You don't want to pee them off. No. Right. And then Robert Miller says, still in Texas. Robert, I, you know, when you when you're back home, I want to get you on the show, and we want to talk about that. I'll, we'll put your videos up, and and we'll do the, do it upright. I want to definitely get you on the show because I think you know even MK thought you, you know, what you were hitting was was typical Bigfoot behavior. Todd Hunter says most Native or First Nations claim they are a separate tribe. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that in many accounts. There's a consistency in all Indian or first tribes. They all talk about an entity or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. And it's similar. And it's mm -hmm. from one continent to another to another. And it's uh, less so maybe in African, Central America and South America. But mm -hmm. in the northern climes, it's amazing, really. Yeah. Well, they've got them in Australia as well. And the Australian yes. Aborigines tell them tell them similar stories, right? Which we will be getting to soon enough. Yes, uh, actually, we're probably a few episodes away from that as we continue our trek <laughs> around the world, covering the the, uh, the uh, cryptids of the world. It's I interesting how you guys I pronounce. Have... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I said I, I should have brought up the fact that MK is a huge Star Trek fan. <laughs> Looks like it. Just a little bit. I forgot to bring those up, and we just got so got so so engrossed in in his stories and what he was talking about. I just, I, I'm I'm telling you, I was this is I learned so much tonight, and Unbelievable. I'm, Unbelievable. I'm just humbled that he was on. It was amazing, uh, folks. If you just tuned in, unfortunately, you missed MK Davis. But uh, go ahead and you know, can, uh, hit that subscribe and like button. And uh, let us know what you're thinking, and uh, we'll ho hopefully be bringing a lot more of this content to you in the future. Uh, next Tuesday night joining us will be Ron Moorhead, who recorded the Sierra Sounds. Um, if you go to YouTube and, go and, and, and search the Sierra Sounds, you will find dozens of videos uh, of, of what they now believe is a Bigfoot-type language. Uh, some of it was referred to as the Samurai Chatter. Uh, and then some of them were just clearly grunts and groans. But that footage, the, uh, the recordings they made in the Sierras, uh, these were recorded back in the 1970s. Uh, they sent them to a Navy cryptolinguist to analyze, and the Navy determined that it was a language of some sort. It wasn't a human language. And they, when they looked at it on an oscilloscope, it, it had uh, segments that were above the human vocal capacity, dipping into infrasound. And so many Bigfoot encounters from people who talk about what they call being buzzed. Uh, they, they said they'll hear a roar and they will feel it in their chest. And that's definitely infrasound. Uh, that's the same thing that people say about tigers. If a tiger roars at them, they'll feel it in their chest. Uh, or when an elephant trumpets, people say they can literally feel it hit them, the, the wave of sound. That's uh, because a lot of it's beyond our, our, our ability to hear. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, it was... Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm deeply grateful that MK agreed to come on the show. It was a fantastic show tonight. Yeah, something else uh, besides infrasound and mind speak in the, the research I've done, 
on uh, Dogmen and on uh, the Sasquatch, uh, there's also something uh, people like to refer to as loss of time. Mm -hmm. And they, they feel like they were hit with some sort of a infrasound that froze them in time. And, you know, I mean, one guy in particular, and I got to interview him, he said he lost three hours. Uh, I think I think that's probably just the effect of the infrasound on the brain. It I'm, probably just it, it, it's already been shown that electronic equipment you know, can be fritzed out until you leave the area. But yeah. The human brain is just a big computer. It runs off electrical impulses. If you've got something in the air that can disrupt electrical impulses, it can disrupt your brain. I've been I've been working on something to counter that to put into my helmet, my my bump helmet. And it can, you know, it's similar to a Faraday cage, uh, aluminum and um, copper, copper. Uh, together, and um, in like a screen type of, mm -hmm. of a configuration. Let me know, know if it works. Around there, and um, I have a gentleman up in um, in the Adirondacks that wants to try it out because he's he's lost bits of time. I mean, right at his own house, he lost about a half an hour of time, and he had people around him uh, within 10 feet of him, actually, in the backyard at nighttime, and, and they said, what happened to you? You just were standing there still for the longest amount of time until they went up to him and touched him, and he lost time, and it, it's happened a couple of times to him. There's been a number of people that have reported similar things to that, that they had been, quote-unquote, stunned by, by a burst of infrasound. And that may be what it is. It just basically froze you in your tracks. Yeah. I mean, some people say, oh, like you just said, froze me in my tracks, and I was so scared. Well, you don't lose a half an hour of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a lot of interviews in my research about the, uh, the lights being overhead, you know, when people had encounters. Uh, and... A lot of people were, were telling me they were losing anywhere from 25 to like 40 minutes of time where they felt like, you know. But this one gentleman in particular lost three hours, and he wound up out of the forest area and on the side of a highway, and somebody actually stopped to see if he was okay. Uh, it, was just, it was just amazing that he lost three hours of time. I read uh, one account from a guy, and I believe it was, I want to say it was in eastern Kentucky. Uh, I don't remember exactly where, but he said he was he was out hiking a trail, and he was taking uh, taking wildlife photos, and he felt like he'd just been buzzed, and he froze there. And, he, and when he came around, he said it would probably been five, ten minutes. He wasn't sure exactly how much time had passed, but right next to him on the trail was a series of large bipedal big footprints about 17 oh. inches long. And right they, weren't, they weren't there when he was walking, when he was <laughs> before. So he thinks that, you know, the, according to the report, that he might have been buzzed and didn't see it walk by him. Bigfoot's messing with him. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Uh. Hi, Larry. Just got home. Uh, hopefully you can watch the entire episode. I think you'll oh, be yeah. impressed. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want to give a shout out to Larry Phelps as well for giving us another like. Thank, Thank you, Larry. You. Uh, I didn't salute each and every one of them. I do so now. <laughs> I wish I would have had the other cup. I was so desperate to use this one tonight. <laughs> I, says, I was two feet away from a lion in the zoo when he let out a full roar, and yes, it seemed like my whole body was vibrating. I only froze in awe for about five seconds, and I was gone. That infrasound is definitely a predator's way of letting you know either go away or you're going to be eaten. Yeah. Tigers have been known to use that to stun their prey before they attack. They'd let out a burst of that infrasound and like goats and things would freeze and bang. There was a, um, there was a program I was watching a month and a half ago on, on television. I think it was discovery channel. And uh, this guy was investigating infrasound and he went to an area where they had uh, tigers in captivity where they, I guess they held them there, and in the United States, and uh, the I might as well call him zookeeper who had this gentleman go with him. Mm -hmm. I said, "Okay, you just step over there into his space and see what he does." And this giant tiger let out a roar, and the guy said, "I mean, he said I almost peed myself." We could we could pull our own research on that. 
What's that? We could do our own research on that and document it ourselves. There's a there's a uh, accredited tiger sanctuary about 20 miles from here. I uh, I I actually have a, a tiger sanctuary up uh, in New Jersey that I can go to also. There's also a wolf sanctuary not too far from here, a few hours away. I was at a um, a zoo in Philadelphia one time, and they had George the tiger there. 950 mm -hmm. pounds. That's a big tiger. No, it was. He was an abnormally large tiger. And I mean, the paws on this, this, this guy was this literally this big. I, it, <laughs> Have you ever seen a liger? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember exactly which way it goes. If you, I think it's if you breed a male tiger to a female lion, it's huge. But if you right. breed a male lion to a female tiger, it's tiny. I don't, I don't know. It's one way or the other, uh, but you know when you get a, a one of the large breed a lion, a liger, they are massive. Yeah, the liger is the uh, female lion and the, and the male tiger, and I've seen them. Those things, they're they're unbelievable. I mean, let me see if I can find a picture of one, whew. and I will throw that. Or have on. a picture of them with the guy that's walking next to them. There's a fellow that has them uh, in his. Uh, I don't want to call it a zoo area. I guess they have a sanctuary, and they're pretty. They're pretty nice too. You know, those ligers. I guess they grew them up since they were little tiny cubs. I just found a really good image. I think uh, this will probably shed some pretty good light on that. <laughs> Look at a baby one with it. That is a big kitty. Look at the head on that thing. Woo. She could ride that. He man and his battle cat right there. That is huge. And that's just, you know, a natural occurrence. That's people, you know, who have bred lions to tigers. Um what what could have what could have existed out there in the wild that we had no idea about? Uh, in the wild, they've discovered hybrids between uh, far ranging grizzly bears and polar bears that have come farther south oh, than normal, yeah. and they've got the traits of both. They're massively broad, like a like a uh, like a uh, brown like a coat. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, grizzly bear, but they're they've got the height of a polar bear. These things are monsters. Unbelievable. There was one uh, one hunter in, in Alaska shot one because he thought it was a grizzly. And when he saw part of some of the fur was white, he thought, oh, crap, I've just shot a polar bear. I'm going to prison. So he calls Game and Fish. And he's like, hey, I think I just accidentally shot a polar bear. And they came out and looked at it like, no, that's not a polar bear. So they did DNA tests on it. And it was it was a crossbreed between a, a polar bear and a, and a grizzly. He said it's rare, but it does happen. And it was a big son of a gun. So my observation to people out there is this. If things like a liger can exist and that uh, half grizz, half polar bear can exist with the interbreeding, who's to say that Sasquatch can't be out there? Who's to say that Dogman can't be out there? I mean, when I went over in um, over the border from Texas over into Mexico years ago, and I, I met up with this rancher who had a, what he said, he killed a chupacabra. Mm -hmm. This thing looked like to me to be part coyote, part wolf. With the mange? The with no yeah. hair? Yeah, and the body, the skin was actually blue, but across the ridge line, from the top of the head all the way down the ridge line, was a little tough of hair. little tough of hair. I measured it. It was 42 inches from the nose to the, to the back of the butt, and uh, it was bluish skin, <laughs> and it, it had a skin disease. It was obvious it had a skin disease. But who's to say a male coyote didn't hook up with a female wolf? Or and, male uh, wolf to female coyote. Yeah, or one way or another. Yeah, well, some, somehow they met on, you know, they had a wild hookup night. One of them got a little too drunk and slummed it with the other. That's, that's it. I mean, who the heck knows? I mean, so, you know, and, and the other thing I tell people is, oh, they say, oh, I don't believe in Sasquatch. I don't believe in Mothman. I don't believe in Dogman. Okay, well, do you believe in atoms? Do you believe in neurons, electrons? Do you believe in the string theory? Because the string theory has been proven, mm -hmm. and you can't ever see it, you know? 
And yet yeah, you believe in oxygen. You're breathing it, but you can't see it. Exactly. You can't see it, can't feel it. But, you know, you get old enough, you might need to use it so they can stick it in a tube. And I, uh, when I look, when I watch other podcasts and then sometimes in the comment sections on some of the Dogman pages that I frequent, uh, I see a lot of people that, that have the belief that Dogman was a military creation or the military uses them. Oh. Um, I did, a, I did an article on that. I don't. I don't think that's the case because no. the dogman type sightings in LBL dated back to the early 1800s when that area right. was first settled. Yeah, you had the uh, you had the people out the lumberjacks out there that discovered it first. Mm -hmm. But my thing is, I I did a an article in conjunction with Jody Cook about that, and the the conclusion really is this: uh, a dogman would not want to be controlled and it would think 24 7 how to escape its control mm -hmm. if you had some kind of a, a shock collar on it that would control it 24 7 how to get away from you how yep. to destroy you no way in hell would they be doing our bidding and there's no way i do i ever believe that that the government has dogmen you know in its employ Absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Some, you, you know, we, we have a large world here, and somebody would have got it on camera. You know, they're doing our bidding or something, and mm -hmm. they would have put it out there. I, I just, everything you do these days is on camera, so forget about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. It just, just wouldn't happen. And like I said, it wouldn't want to be controlled. Right. And not a dog, man. Eventually, it would find a way to slip that control. <laughs> like like the Velociraptors in uh, Jurassic Park checking the fence systematically, it's gonna it's gonna find a way out. Uh, Luis Noriega says, uh, "I don't remember a book I read a long time ago, but there were werewolves working for the American army to defeat the Germans." Uh, it's a cool premise for a book. Uh, yeah. The Germans actually had a group they called the werewolves. I was gonna uh, say it's the other way around, VA. Yeah. Yeah, the Germans had a group that they called the werewolves, and I don't know if there's any truth to them being able to change or anything like that, but that's what they called them. You know, the Germans were looking into every which way they could fight us. Oh, yeah. And they were looking into, into the occult. They were looking into the, uh, you know, just like the... In they the tried to find the staff of Longinus. Yeah, they were, they were trying to find anything they could use to, to fight us, and, you know, thank God they didn't. Mm -hmm. Todd Hunter says, we are so arrogant as a people that we assume we know everything there is to know, but yet there are so many mysteries still left to discover if we only let, let go of our skepticism. Ah, You're absolutely well, right. I mean, we don't need to look to the ocean to prove that. We know uh, less about the bottom of the ocean than we do about the surface of the moon. I mean, there are huge sections of the ocean that are outside the normal trade routes where boat or shipping goes that if your Mariana, boat got lost out there, they'd never find you. Yeah. Mariana Trench, I mean, it's it's so deep that we can't even get down there. And you just, I mean, look at uh, look at some of the vitamins we take, a thing called krill oil. Mm -hmm. That's all the way down there at the bottom over there. And, and at least we can get that far to get it. But uh, I mean, that's really super far down. The, the Mariana Trench is so far down that any vehicle we send down there will, you know, even unmanned will get crushed. So it's possible that there are things down there still alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we know maybe I don't even want to say one tenth. We know <laughs> one well, thousandth of one percent of what we can possibly find out about the ocean. It was within our lifetimes that the giant squid was considered a cryptid, a myth, a myth. Yeah, the and, kraken. Yeah, the yeah. kraken was a, was just a myth. Yet we're finding them. Well, they got, yeah. they got one squid that they have that's uh, 40 feet, and then they found the super giant squid. Mm -hmm. That thing's more like 58 feet. That's, I a, mean, that's a big monster. Feet. Yeah, measure 58 feet lengthwise, and then when it spreads out, I mean, that's a big sucker. You know, there was this Japanese researcher that within the last 10 years did that. He was out there, you know, between Midway and, and Japan, and he was looking and hoping to get lucky. And I forget the actual depth. But if I remember correctly, it was between 150 and 300. And he got the images. And it is immense what is down there. Oh, and it's exactly what you guys are talking about, the sizes. And people would say, no, it's not true. They're not that big. 
and yet he was able to get images. I don't know if it was once or twice, but there are multiple images. And being that it's underwater, it was just unreal because they were able to determine the size of it due to the length, or I'm sorry, maybe not necessarily the length, but the the dimension or the thickness of the tentacle. You know, it's just like, we can tell how big we are. Or you, you get the impression of our fingers. You know, we can tell how big we could be. But when you look at the size of a paw of a tiger, it's just, we get the impression it's much bigger. And I'm sure they can do the exact same thing when it came to that squid or whatever it was. Well, like the Russians, they use calculations to determine things. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is a way to determine that without actually having to compare it against anything else. Yeah, no, you're right. But uh, the, the giant, the super giant Kraken, oh my God, that thing is unbelievable. There yeah. were, there, there's folklore, you know, once again, we learned from folklore. Uh, they said the, uh, in the old days, the Kraken was as, as large as an island, some of them, you know, and when uh, the sailors would land, well, the Kraken would say, okay, <laughs> dinner time. <laughs> yeah. them up. Ding, 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 ding. I can't yeah. imagine something that large. My gosh. Well, what is one of the more famous ones that was just found within the last 30, 40 years, and it was believed to be a prehistoric animal? It's the coelacanth, isn't it? Uh, they found the coelacanth in, like, I want to say, in like the 1930s or 40s. Yeah. Yeah, The uh, a lady who was a um, museum uh, curator, she, would, uh, she set out and told all the... Uh, the different uh, fishermen and everything, you know, if you find anything odd, bring it to me. And yeah, they brought yeah, it to they her did. and they yeah, they'd found fossil out. records of it and they thought it died out during the time of the dinosaurs. And right. They found this, I think, I, I want to say it was 10,000 Mad years. Either uh, Madagascar or Papua New Guinea, someplace like that. They found this tribe that had been eating them forever. They're like, oh, yeah, they're very good. Yeah. We <laughs> <got> it <laughs> it yeah, turns out this, this woman paid the, uh, the guy at the fish market. Two dollars and thirty cents American for it, and she found the discovery of a lifetime. It was amazing. And cryptozoologists everywhere were like, <laughs> "Let me find that tribe. I'll give you two dollars and thirty. I'll give you two fifty, oh, bro." Oh. Two dollar really does make you holler. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. Oh well. I don't think we're going to get nailed on that one or demonetized. No, no. <laughs> no. Robert says the Meg. There are, there are a lot yeah. of, of scientists, especially the guys at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, uh, who postulate the, the possible existence of the Meg, that it's still there. A lot of shark experts. Oh, well, well the same thing with the giant, uh, giant squid. Uh, by observing whales, some of these deep diving whales. Uh, oh, they, have, yeah. they have found whales that come up with sucker They're marks like on them. Starred. Yeah, they've got right. stars on them from suckers from a from a squid that are you know wider than your shoulders. And then the, the and still others that have part of their fluke missing or a chunk out of their side were something really big, bit a bit a hunk out of them. But I've been up to the Woods Holes Institute there, and that's <laughs> Really they can't taste as good as a manatee. Oh, the huge manatees. <laughs> oh, that's not nice. <laughs> Little mayonnaise. I actually believe that there is such a thing as a, a the Meg. I do, uh, too. I've gotten yeah. some of the brochures and paperwork from the Woods Hole Institute, because back when I wanted to, wanted to become an oceanographer, that's where I wanted to go, and they've got so much on it. And if this thing does exist... It's it's like three times the size of the biggest whale you've ever seen. Yeah, three I, times the size were, of the blue whale. They were uh, the the show I watched on them about the Meg. Uh, they estimated uh, between sixty and eighty feet long. <laughs> you know, weighing like forty <laughs> tons. And that 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 seems to be like the baby too. Because yeah, they get some, big. Some of the Maybe. information I've read says that they're even bigger. Have you heard of the uh, fossils, skeletons, everything they're finding in the Sahara? Uh -uh. It is absolutely amazing. The size of whales, the size of sharks, uh, the the Meg. Oh, yeah, it existed before. And in the Sahara, which was a prehistoric seafloor, you know, millions of years ago, the things just settled at the bottom, and they're finding them in this the Sahara. Is a 
This is the jawbone of a megalodon. Yeah, it wouldn't even taste you. Yeah, it would just you would be like krill going yeah, you, through. You it. might shoot out through a gill slit if you're lucky. Yeah, <laughs> if you were really lucky. My name is Jonah. <laughs> Jonah in the Meg. Whoop. <laughs> nah. It sort of makes me wonder sometimes because I, I've been out there in the ocean. I've, I've had a scuba license since I was like 16. My uncle owned a scuba shop down on the uh, Jersey Shore. And there's not too much that really scares me. But I got to admit, one time in my life, I got the pee scared out of me. I was, I was with six other guys. Two were top men inside the boat and four of us. Where we were paired off two and two. We were in the water just off the Jersey Shore, past the continental shelf, and we felt vibrations coming at us. So we we mount motion to each other, you know, and go up. We hit we hit the top, pop down our, our goggles, and we're looking around, looking around, and sure as shit, what's headed right towards us? A tanker, an oil tanker. The oh. big ones, not the small ones that take Super the oil tankers. off. The friggin' screws on these things are yeah. about, my God, I, they're about 35, 40 feet wide, you know, circumference, and there's six of them. I mean, that sucker could have made us into little fish chum. So this will <laughs> <this'll laughs> scare you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't. don't think I want to meet up with the uh, Megalodon, the Big Mama. Holy crow. That's a big fish. I'm not sure if you guys were here and the audience that we have, I mentioned that due to these little helicopter thingies, these little drones that are now going off the coast, yeah, we are discovering that the sharks are much closer than we've ever believed that they were. <laughs> They're just hanging out on the periphery. And it's amazing because the drones can see right down and they're picking up images of not one, two, three, but hundreds of sharks just cruising. It's amazing. <laughs> it brings a whole new meaning to spring break in Daytona, Florida. I'm telling you. No kidding. <laughs> it's yeah, no in kidding. the ocean and it's like bite. Uh-uh. Yeah. Here we That's go. I, uh, I got one of those videos for you, Raj. This is, uh, this is drone footage. Oh, that was going to be La Llorona. No, no, no. This is a drone filming sharks right off the beach. Oh, God. Look at that. That was right off the beach. Exact. Oh, Lord. Where is this? Uh, off of Florida. <laughs> well, I believe one of the no-go zones is off Cape Town, right? Mm -hmm. In South Africa. It's yeah, like Shark Alley or whatever it's yeah, called. There's huge populations of great whites there. You know what that means. You go to Florida. Look at that. Look at that, guys. Jeez, oh, Pete. You go in three feet into the ocean, and that's about as far as you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're just crude. You, They're everywhere. I heard someone say one time, you put your toe in the ocean, and you just knocked yourself off the top of the food chain. Mm -mm. <laughs> Because killer, whale, killer whales have come up on the beach and dragged seals back in the water. So oh, I was thinking of that earlier, yes. If you're, in, if you're at the edge of the water, you're fair game. Hey, wait a minute. Is that a guy on a surfboard on the lower uh, area? Yeah, a couple guys in paddleboard. Yes, board they are. And look oh, at how boy. close they are. Uh, That's what I was talking about. Excellent. Yeah. Thank Screw you. Screw that. <laughs> that these uh, surfers the place. had no idea yeah. how Those close they were. out there on their surfboards have no idea how many sharks yeah. are just right there around them. There's some, that guy sitting on a surfboard with his little feet in the water. Shark come yeah. up, nibble on a foot, you know? Take bite. a foot and go on his merry way. Are they freaking nuts? Where the hell's Baywatch? Tell them well, the, the thing is that we didn't know. Apparently, this is not a, this is not new behavior. It's just we're just now noticing it because of drones. Yeah. <laughs> and and remember, the further out you get, the darker the water is. Mm -hmm. They can't see. <laughs> I mean, maybe out there in the Caribbean, where it's the clear water, but this is. It's crazy. Remember uh, the, the look how close the, that one is to this guy. And yeah. Sure. 
one of the most terrifying stories I ever heard about the ocean is a buddy of mine. Uh, he's a certified driver, diver. Ah. He was telling me that uh, he was diving off of an island uh, in the Pacific. And this is the, not even a shark story. It just freaked me out. I mean, it like made, made my heart skip a beat. He said he wasn't very far offshore, and he swam into some kelp, and he was, like, pushing it out of his way. And uh, he passed, as he was coming out the other side, he says, only about 10 feet thick. He's kind of had to push his way through it. The kelp fronds kind of floating around. Said when he parted the kelp fronds and looked on the other side, the ground just dropped away to nothing. He said he was staring literally into the abyss. He said, I never felt more insignificant in my life. God knows how deep that was. He said, out in the Pacific, he said, it could have been miles deep. He said, and the weird part was, I felt like it was pulling me out there. That is something. Wow. Yeah. Oop. Uh, my brother commented that they asked people not to go uh, swimming by the Santa Barbara Islands because of the high seals population. They might mistake you for one. Santa Barbara mm-hmm. Islands are just off the coast of Santa Barbara. They're, I don't know, 30, 40 miles off the coast. You can see them. They're, uh, you can't swim there. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, there's a sanctuary on one of them. There's a military base on another. Actually, I believe most of them are sanctuaries. Catalina Island is a famous one. That's one of the furthest south. You can go there, mm-hmm. and it's cool. And they have a very famous airport on the other side where it's it's a cliff where once you get to the end, it goes down. Yeah, the, whew, that's, that, that's what scares me is not knowing the bottom. Beneath, and, uh, my buddy, my buddy Clint Bruce, uh, former Navy SEAL, uh, him and I were talking one time, and he said the the most scared he was ever in his life is him. He was leading a group of group a team. They they departed from a submarine hatch, and they were swimming in open ocean, heading for their de- their destinations. So I can't tell you where. He said it was fairly fairly well lit because the water was clear but they were deep enough where they couldn't be seen from the surface he said they were just swimming along heading for the destination he says and i just happened to look down and just at the edge of of our vision something way bigger than our formations oh yeah beneath us he said i have never been more terrified in my life there's probably a lot i said what'd you do he said i kept my eyes forward and just kept swimming open it and didn't take any notice it doesn't bite well, yeah. I was going to say, maybe whales kind of like to screw with us from time to time. Uh, Nick, uh, is everything okay? Did, did you get a call or something? Yeah, I got to get, guys. Um, oh. Say goodnight. Nick, thank you for coming on, man. Thank you for having me. That was an education. Well, we've thank got you, next week on Tuesday night, we've got uh, Ron Moorhead from the, the Sierra Sounds, if you want to come back I, and join that. I'd be on with you, definitely. And I will, tomorrow. I will let you know. Yeah, we got tomorrow and tomorrow, too. Well, yeah. tomorrow you guys got Sarah remember. Gilbert. Sarah I'm Gilbert on, will be joining uh, us. Paranormal Roundtable. With, oh yeah, uh, you'll be you'll be on Paranormal. I've got to listen to that after I after our show. Yeah, you're not going to see any arguments or anything silly. Um, you know, I will I will handle myself with proper decorum. Well, I will um, definitely be listening to that. I just have some questions for the gentleman, and you know, we'll leave it at that. You know, I don't want to mess things up. Yeah, I don't want to don't want to get into that, but you're a good man, yeah. Nick. Yeah, I, I'm kind of like I'm kind of with you, Nick. I mean, there are things that kind of you know twitched my antenna, so to speak, that I felt were not quite right. But I'm not going to call anybody a liar. I'm just no, I, I, you know, some things just didn't seem right to me. No, I mean, I have some questions, and I'll, I have the proper way of asking them. I'm not going to be uh, confrontational or anything like that. And you know, anybody that knows yeah, me, knows I don't I, know what that means. <laughs> no, nobody, everybody knows me knows I don't curse. So yeah. Uh, so, well, well I, I sent you my list of questions that I had that came to yeah. mind. So mm-hmm. I, have I know we're on the same page. I have a bunch over here ready, ready to go. So uh, that's what I'll be. I'll be asking them tomorrow in a nice way. Okay. But gentlemen, really, thanks for having me on. It was great. It was an education. Thank you, sir. Welcome anytime, man. Like like Roger was saying, you're uh, you're not just a guest. You're part of the family now, so you're welcome anytime. Yeah, tough shit. You're in the family. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. One, one more thing before I go, Roger. We got to have a three way, uh, the three of us here for the um, getting the uh, conference hall and everything ready for 2022. Mm-hmm. That is a must. That is a must. And and I and I've investigated those little bottles mm-hmm. and. 
uh, DA, you're going to have to get me to the, the sampling that I can put into the bottles. <laughs> I'll have everything printed up and we can sell it there. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. I'll talk to you. All right, Nick. Have a great night. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Bye-bye. Sir. Good morning. Whew. It's an incredible amount of activity. We still have quite a few people watching us oh, today. Yeah. Yeah, uh, across cool. the channels, we want to thank everyone. Ozarks Haunted Pathways, NDB Media, uh, The Nightmare Hunter, DA Roberts, NDB Media on Twitch. Quite a few people are watching us. If you are watching and you want to leave a comment, let us know who you are and where you hail from. It makes us feel special. <laughs> so it's all good in the hood, so they say, but we still have quite a few people. And we are eternally grateful. Uh, well done. Yeah, it was it was quite a bit going on tonight. Uh, Mr. Miller, I am looking so forward. Oh, uh, by the way, that was funny. Yes, either fly or fall in Catalina, yes. And uh, Robert, thank you for being out there in Texas. I can't, I can't wait because now you are the most recent one in the family to have a story to tell. So I look forward. And Robert, hopefully you'll be back in time. You do have the invite to May 24th uh, to be with us. What do the little bottles? Yeah, what are, what's up with the little bottles? He, he was talking about making uh, uh, Steve St. Louis yes. drawing dog man. <laughs> That's funny. Yes, we were messing around the other day about maybe selling that at the convention. It would be just for a gag. I mean, we're not legitimately trying to sell Dogman scent lure, but it would just be something funny and associated with the show. Speaking of associated work. with the show, oh, here we uh, go. I got my T-shirt order in. They're supposed to be here by by uh, my birthday. Uh, so I will have a DAX Machina shirt. I'll have a Codename Wild Hunt shirt and a Steve's Pub and Grub shirt. So I'll be... Steve's Doe Scent. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Steve's Dog Man Scent. <laughs> well, it could be that. Uh, folks, uh, we are going to be celebrating DA's birthday on the Veterans Day. We're going to be respectful, but we will be on Veterans Day uh, in the evening, uh, May 31st. And we're gonna celebrate DA's birthday when he when it turns midnight for him. So Sweet. we're gonna be live on that day just to celebrate this little man's birthday over here. So looking forward to that. Uh, but we do have again a guest for tomorrow. <laughs> I had to put that up. I did make a joke about my little car, yes. And it is funny. Um, Robert hits me with the Versa, which is absolutely funny. Matt <laughs> gets me with the Siesta Hunter. And uh, there were a few others as well. I mean, Matt took a hellish shot at me last time. But yeah. I, for those of you that know and don't know, we have the option to chat privately, all the guests and all the hosts. And when Big Slappy or whatever his name was, I mean, come on. Slap happy, give me a break. And the way he had that mic, it was a phallic symbol. But I, I commented about it being white or whatever. <laughs> and there were several comments in the chat room, which was kind of funny. And Matt didn't say a word until he says, okay, guys, I'm sorry. I'm falling asleep, so I'm going to have to go. But unlike Roger, who falls asleep on air, I will leave. Hey, what the hell? I felt like uh, the Wolf of Wall Street when Donnie's like, hey, why are you coming at me that way? Why are you coming at me? <laughs> Come at me, bro. Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, it was just rather funny. I did feel like the Wolf of Wall Street. And it, it's amusing, folks. I mean, don't get me wrong. I find it funny that each and every one of us has something on others. It's funny. It is a family, for lack of a better word. Absolutely. And my brother, to get under my skin, always puts, puts the D in and Roger. Team. Like, where the hell did that come from? But whatever. Oh, my goodness. And he knows it already. I've been on him for it, and he still does it. So, oh, of what? course. What are brothers for, man? Uh, I, I, I guess he found out that it got under my skin. I admitted it. So, so now he quit, won't quit doing it. <laughs> and I continue. I won't let it go. So it is what it is. 
But all right. Uh, what an excellent program, DA. Uh, you and uh, Nick did real well. It's really cool. It's really fun to be a part of it. Um, what else do you want to talk about tonight? I'm, I'm completely up for grabs. I what do you want to talk about? Oh, I, I was, I was, confer- I was acknowledging, yeah, dude, I'm done too. <laughs> but no, you're still, you're still uh, ready to go. I do have to get to work early because I am going to be on 24 hour duty starting Thursday morning. Oh, that does sound like a lot of fun. I'm going to be on 24 hours all the way through to midnight on May 17th. So, um, so you probably won't be able to join us for DAX Machina on Saturday. Uh, there's a good chance I will, but my daughter, I'm sorry. Ooh, that was a Freudian slip. Hey, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Good night or good morning. Depends on where you are. Um, I don't know. I, at each day is filling up the day before. So there's a good chance I can join. I might join you late at night and pull off the siesta. Okay. The siesta hunter may make an appearance. Yeah, Sean, uh, my, our guest is going to be uh, Sean Chester, who uh, writes uh, zombie apocalypse books with a military twist. Uh, they're actually... Uh, like you! <laughs> yeah, well, no, I do the, the, the cryptids with the military. But uh, Sean's books are very well researched, and he knows his craft. Um in fact, uh, they would be a very good fit for anybody that likes my code name Wild Hunt books. Uh, Sean's a great writer, an awesome guy, and uh, you definitely need to check out Sean Sean's book, SeanChester.com, uh, or find him on Amazon. Uh, but he'll be joining us in the studio on Saturday night if you're DAX Machina. And tomorrow night, we have... Who do we have, Raj? Oh, wait, tomorrow? Tomorrow night. Uh, yes, we have Sarah Gilbert. Uh, she is an accomplished author as well in the field in the culinary field. I like but, uh Yeah, she's she's actually done quite a few things. She's been on Paula Dean's website, and she's done quite a few things at a rather young age. She has the love, and she has the culinary skills. But and we will talk about that tomorrow. But she's actually. Uh, going to tell us about her experiences, right, DA? Mm-hmm. She has a, a number of paranormal experiences she's going to come on and share with us. And um, I think it's going to be a good uh, good show. Uh, also, a reminder, on Friday night, we have the Zombie Authors uh, Roundtable. Uh, it's going to be me and, well, the list keeps growing. Um, so we'll be rotating authors in and out. Um, What's Will up, you brother? tell us why you're doing that? What yeah. happened, DA? Because Please. I, I was selected as the zombie book of the month. Uh, my book, Ragnarok Rising Awakening. Um, and um, yeah, it was selected as zombie book of the month on, on, on by the Facebook group. And um, it's it, it's a huge honor. Um, I, I don't definitely don't want to understate that, but I'm generally not one to talk about you know, awards and stuff for me. Um, but I'm, I'm very proud to have received it. And this is going to be for that. I'm going to have authors featuring Jamie Hernandez, Alan Gamboa, Stephen Kenny, Sylvester Barzi, Teal James Glenn, Bethany Stutzman Hargart, Mike Evans, Tim Cavier, Scott Baker, and Stephen Landry. At this point, there probably will be more. Uh, and this is going to be the time we fill all 10 spots on this for the first time. And uh, I'm hoping Roger will be able to, to join us on Friday night because I will certainly need the help wrangling that large of a crew. Yeah, I, I will see. Good night, Lewis. Thank you for spending time with us again. Night, we're going to be on tomorrow. Just remember, folks, we're going to be on tomorrow at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Same channel. Same, same bat time. time. Same bat uh, time. <laughs> this is how it's so Okay, I just heard some dogs barking. And you, you, you always know which ones are the ones that are barking too after a while. You know how many houses down. And it reminds me, it tells me the story, or reminds me of the story, I believe it was a 1971 earthquake in Silmar. I was under two years old when it happened. But my mother, my father at the time recently passed, of course. And, uh, well, not recently, it's 2019. But anyway... When the earthquake struck, 
you could hear the dogs in the neighborhood barking in succession as it was getting closer. So you could actually tell the direction of the earthquake. It was coming from over there because the dogs were barking. My father told this story that when the earthquake hit in the early morning hours, that he was trying to wake up, I mean, get out of bed, and he was trying to put his pants on, and he couldn't because of the violent shaking. He said he tried to put his pants on, and he missed because it was so violent. That's why. Well, yeah, it, it's and it's a great story. But the one, folks, if you really want to know a little bit about Silmar, you've got to look up Silmar Earthquake Fire Station uh, Fire Station Tire Marks. Folks, you know fire trucks. Okay, mm -hmm. You've seen them. You know how heavy those little rats are. In, and the hair is already standing in the back of my neck. I know we're way off topic, and I apologize, but it's this is the amazing force of earthquakes and stuff. They have pictures, and they're probably at the USGS.gov website. But anyway, when you look it up, you can see that over in Silmar, San Fernando, when it struck, it was so violent that the tire marks from the fire truck as it was bouncing – and would bounce off the wall. They were two to three feet off the ground. Ooh. Folks, obviously not three feet, but two feet. Think about the violent shaking to get that multi-ton truck to even bend and flex in such a way that the tire marks were two feet in the air. Wow. That's power. Earthquakes are phenomenal, phenomenally powerful things. I mean, when the New Madrid went off, the Mississippi River rolled backwards. That's power. As a matter of fact, since I do programs like that, I am thinking of revisiting that one. I'm going to do that one sometime later this year. I'm going to be doing a special on the New Madrid because, as you know, I do have a tiny geology background, and not only geology – but tectonics, I've studied in my entire life. I'm going to do something on that. Who knows? Maybe DA will join me for that one as well. Sure. And, and, and I'm just a late. And I'll blend what knowledge I do have. Uh, I did live for. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I did live for a short while. Yes, Roger. Remember when you lived on Warner with me? We had a pool, and probably we had. Oh, the Landers earthquake. We had three foot waves hit apartment across from me. Yes, the Landers earthquake was in 1995. If I'm not mistaken, the offset was between 18, no, 13 and 18 feet. And what do I mean? There's this road that led to Landers, and you can see the crack in the, in the ground. The road was offset by 13 to 18 feet. Wow. That's the entire roadway. It was unbelievable. And Landers was, if I'm not mistaken, in 1995. There was quite a bit of activity, and it was because Northridge was 94, Landers was 95, and the Hector Mine Quake was around that time, too. These were 7.0. Powerful. Low rider fire engines. That's funny, Larry. Oh, and that'll even really warp your sense of <laughs> how it was bouncing. Planet shifting power, yes. But the Landers Quake hit in 1995. My brother was still down in Orange County. I was in Montebello when it struck, and my sister, uh, my older sister, was with us at the time, and it was it was a seven point something, seven point one or seven point five, I forget. And Landers was, and Landers, which is somewhere out by Twenty Nine Palms, was devastated. Yeah, it was a desert town, just absolutely devastated, and uh, yeah, it was crazy. Well, the last big earthquake we had, I believe, was on July 4th, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shook us up for a while. Yeah, that one was out the, oh, 184 miles away. And it still shook this place real good. You guys get hyper because you guys got earthquakes in the 1 to 2 to 3 range. Do you know what that is for us? A punchline. <laughs> If it's in the four range, people are like, hey, did you feel it? Hey, where were you? When it's five, it's like, oh, that was so exciting. When it gets to six, we start to get to get we start to get serious. 
And when the seven, yeah, holy crap. I had heard and I studied as to why Southern California structures are made out of wood. And that's so that the structure can bend and flex during the earthquake. And I had heard about the way it bends and flex. And I've seen the simulations and stuff. And I remember being up in the middle of the night during earthquakes. And I said, one of these days I'm going to pay attention. And folks, I don't remember which one it was, but I was in my room. And even in the middle of the night, it's amazing how clear you can get images and how you can crystallize and see in the dark. I looked up to the corner of my room, and the best way I can describe it is, you know, this is the corner of the room. Here's the ceiling corner. I saw the wall bend behind the corner, if you can imagine that. And I'm looking at it. I'm saying, "Uh uh-uh, that's not right. It's... It's not supposed to be that way, but it did. It bent behind it. It was bending and flexing. And to this day, I'll never forget seeing that and saying, no, no, not right. Till you see structures bend and flex in earthquakes, you haven't seen anything. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. I was way off topic. I'm sorry, D. Oh, you're you're fine, dude. Yeah. Talk all, talk all you want. Oh, it's all good. I'm excited. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Now my brother's really coming back with some stuff. Yes, and my brother was a CS tech, uh, so he was a purchasing tech for a while. He was also in environmental services. My brother's done quite a bit of stuff as well. Working in a hospital in Orange County, I got to see several earthquakes. While I could see the hallway, oh, go left and right. The first quake was going north and south. It was going up and down. <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, and you you it's going in one direction and you gotta skirt down the hallway. <laughs> I can only imagine what that was like. I did. I worked at the same hospital my brother did for a short while I was an admitting rep. Good job. The job was not good for me. I was a money collector and I disliked that. Ugh. You got a patient coming in, you gotta look up in the book, and these were massive books that had the frequent flyers and you got the people coming in and say, Oh, Hey, you owe us $30,000. How much are you going to pay? Oh man. I was, yeah, it's not me. And they disliked me in the admitting department because I was the only one that wouldn't collect money. And they would score like a 30% bonus of whatever they collected. So they wanted the money and I was like, Hey, no, no, no. don't count me in. I don't want to play. But the way they saw it was, well, we want someone that is hungry. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was not nice. But anyway, good job. They do well. I just, I had a translate in the emergency room and I was, I was done. It's like, no, it's no fun having to translate and tell parents, uh, you effed up. Yeah, I, I had to do that on one of them and it was it was horrible i had to tell the parent the the doctor the nurse wanted to, you know they were having me translate and they asked the parents why didn't you wait for the ambulance they said well i was already taking so long so they drove to the hospital it took much longer by the time they got to the hospital the emergency room could not save the child oh that's horrible. so they made me tell them because of you, your child is dead. And I looked at my, I, I can't tell them that. It's like, you tell them that. I put my badge down and I walked home and I left. They called me back. I got to admit it. They called me back. They gave me an entire day. They said, are you going to come back to the job? I was like, holy crap. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> They let me go. They 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 realized what they did, and uh, I was fortunate. They 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 gave me an entire day. They paid me the whole day, <laughs> and they gave me a full day off. And they said, "Are you coming back?" Okay, yeah, I'll come back. I still wasn't there very long though. First job I got was the county, and I've been there almost thirty years now. <laughs> the rest is history. It was a difficult job. It wasn't for me. 
And that's the way it was. Yes. And we are getting near the end. I guess you learned a little bit from me. I may still... Oh, my God. Do I? Oh, wait a minute. Hold on a minute. I uh -oh. may have my badge. Row, oh, Raggy. Row, row. Do I have the badge? I think I may have my badge from the hospital. <laughs> um, you think it's still active? No, but you know, I looked like a little twenty-one year old and I kept the badge because it would allow me to get through security, you know, um I was a first responder. I could get through the police lines. I have it somewhere I have to find it. So but anyway, all right. Sorry. Uh my brother says, yeah, he had to translate as well. My brother did a lot at that hospital at all the hospitals he was at, and I get it. But yeah, I'm going on. I'm going to start losing the audience, and I don't want to do that. We've done very well today. I don't want to blow that. It's been an incredible show. Yes, it has. And I'm ruining it by going on and on at the yeah, end. Yay, yeah. anything else? It's our wind down. Uh, we've already reminded everybody of the coming shows. Next week, we have Ron Moorhead on Tuesday. Uh, the Nightmare Hunter will be coming to you on Tuesday instead of Monday because Raj has other commitments he has to take care of on the 17th. Uh, it's the final uh, final day of tax season, so he is going to be uh, <laughs> as busy as a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest. It's the culmination of two years, folks. Last year never ended. Mm -hmm. It just bled into this year, and I mean that, bled into it. But uh, our guest that night will be Ron Moorhead. We'll be talking about the Sierra Sounds and listening to some of those. And um, we have a action-packed week the rest of this week. Uh, tune in and, and check it out. Uh, the, not counting, you know, sports talk with the guys and the the uh, guys over at uh, All Tower at All, Media. Tower at All Tower. It's a full week. There's several more programs coming this week. So watching DB Media, folks. We we've 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 got stuff that'll that'll keep you occupied, and, and the, if, the network continues to grow. And if I may humbly offer, hey, remember Blog Talk. I'm putting it in the uh, BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash DB Media. Tuesday night, Fandom Access. Wednesday night, Travel Talk Radio. The 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 Rock and Roll Shrink on Thursday night, Travel Itch Radio. On Sunday night, Casey Shapiro's The Walking Dead. Folks, on the NDB Media Network, there's a lot of stuff going on. And possibly Kat Dolman may be coming over to NDB Media as well. Probably this fall. Yeah. Well, or just saying. Walking Dead. It's better than The Walking Dead. Uh -huh. You know... Monsters, I hate them. Zombies, ah. <laughs> that's pretty good, Lewis. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll have them on one of these days. But I do want to wish my sister. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do want to wish my okay, Rose. Her birthday was on Saturday. On uh, my other sister Alma, her birthday is tomorrow. So Alma. Happy birthday. Lewis's uh, birthday passed on the 24th of April. Of course, on Happy the 21st. Birthday. Happy late birthday. So it's Happy my brother birthday. and I are separated by three days. My sisters are separated by four days. And the boys are in April. The girls are in May. So that's the Noriega family not, right not there. Not the same year, though, right? America! <laughs> Live long and prosper. Yes, Josh. Peace and long life. We are out of here, folks. Good night, everybody. Peace.